Good evening and welcome to the second consecutive special uh, meeting of the Board of Education concerning superintendent interviews. Um, I'll repeat some of the things we had last night uh, for the audience. Please turn off the cell phones as usual for our meetings. Um, and uh, as we go through the interview process, um, uh, it'll be about an hour's worth of questions with about 10 minutes of time for you to ask us questions. And uh, first to begin the meeting, I will ask the Secretary to call the roll. Gladly. Uh, President Wasserman. Here. Vice President Baker. Here. Secretary mm -hmm. Kaminsky, I'm here. Treasurer Brandstant. Here. Member Gordon. Here. Member McFarland. Here. Member Vanderkellen. Here. Present. <coughs> All present account for. Great. Uh, we have no formal request to address the board this evening. Does anybody want to address the board besides our candidate? Seeing none, we'll move on to the interviews. Um, Rick, we've prepared questions that each board member will uh, ask you. In fairness, each uh, candidate is being asked the same initial questions. Uh, there will be follow-up questions to each of those that dig deeper into either more clarification or expanding on an interesting point that you may raise. Mm -hmm. We'll be looking for as much as possible examples of what you have done, especially in your superintendency, uh, concerning questions that may come up. Okay, so give us a concrete feel for what you've accomplished and done in regards to the question. Um, all candidates will be presenting the same questions to that. And remind all the board members all the questions need to meet all the legal qualifications of the questions we outlined yesterday in terms of race, religion, age, et cetera, especially on the follow-up questions. Any questions from you at this stage on how we're going to proceed? None at all. I'm ready to go. Okay. Fantastic. And I start the ball rolling a little bit. Um, let's begin by having you just tell us uh, briefly about yourself and your career path and any concrete examples of your most notable achievements throughout that career. Well, I'll start with uh, just a little bit about myself. I am a father of two kids and a husband to my wife, Jody. Eric, my son, is 11 years old. I have an 8-year-old daughter, Anna. Uh, Anna is going on 22 years old right now. Those of you that have raised girls can sympathize with where I'm at with that. <laughs> um, enjoying every minute of it, but boy, it's not without its, not without its challenges. That's, that's for certain. Um, I want to thank the board for the opportunity. This is really a neat opportunity for me, having been a Midland Public Schools employee in the past. Coming back and interviewing for this position is it's just neat. It's exciting for me, and I, and I want you to know sincerely that, I, um, that I'm grateful for the privilege tonight. Career path-wise, I'm going to take you back a little further than, um, than maybe you want me to. But I think it's important, as you get to know me tonight, where I come from educationally. And uh, so I'm going to roll back time. I graduated, obviously, from high school and uh, attended community college. I attended Mid-Michigan Community College for a very brief period of time. And we won't go into the details of why that period of time was as brief as it was. Um, but I, I left community college and joined the Marine Corps. I spent four and a half years in the Marine Corps as an infantry squad leader. Uh, I'm not going to say that it was thoroughly enjoyable every minute of the time that I was there, but it certainly taught me a great deal. But one of the things that happened during that time that I was in the Marine Corps that really changed my life substantially forever and probably put me in this chair um, in front of you this evening was I was selected late in my career to attend the Marine Corps Non-Commissioned Officers Leadership Academy. And it's an academy set up for um, enlisted men and women to learn a little bit about themselves from a leadership perspective and a lot about how to lead others. I was selected to go to that, went, and part of the training was that you had to stand in front of your peers and deliver a lesson. The lesson could be of your choosing, and for whatever reason, and I, and I, I don't know why, I wish I could remember, I'm, certainly, I'm certain that it was uh, uh, earth shattering, <laughs> but I had decided to deliver a lesson on the effects of a nuclear chemical or biological attack. And I stood in front of probably 300 other Marines and, and delivered this lesson. And when I did that, the, my colleagues were spellbound by it. It went off splendidly. And I stood there that, that day and I said to myself, this is what I'm supposed to do. And it wasn't running through the desert or the jungle with a gun. It was teaching. And at that time in my life, I said, I I'm supposed to be a teacher. I remember getting home from the, the non-commissioned officers leadership academy and I finished second in the class. My wall locker wasn't squared away enough. Some of my shirts weren't pressed appropriately, so second. <laughs> I've, I've fixed that since. But I, I remember getting home to the barracks and calling my mom and saying, Mom, you're not going to believe it. I finished second in the class. 
um, you have to call Central Michigan University because I have to be a teacher. And my mom, you know, of course, I think in the background was saying, thank God he's not going to re-enlist. Um, <laughs> but a teacher? <laughs> Seriously? So uh, I, I, did, I did get out of the Marine Corps. I was honorably discharged. I did go to Central Michigan University. I did graduate. Uh, it took three and a half years to move through the program there, which was very quick at the time. And the reason it was so fast is I was so focused. I, I had to be a teacher. That was what my life's work was going to be, and there was no two ways about it. I moved through the program very quickly, student taught, was ultimately hired in Petoskey to be a science teacher. I had a bachelor's degree in biology and earth science, and I was hired to teach biology in Petoskey. I didn't end up in Petoskey. Before I actually moved there and started the position, Gladwin Community Schools called and said, Rick, we're starting an alternative education program, and we'd really like you to start it. We don't have anything in place yet, but we think this is a spot that you could help us out. I didn't even know what alternative education was. But it was in Gladwin, which was my hometown. I went, sure. I declined the, posi the position in Petoskey, took the position in Gladwin teaching alternative education, showed up day one of the program, and uh, had, all these, had all these students ready and eager to learn, right? I mean, that's what happens in alternative education. They're beating the door down to learn, not so much, and <laughs> opened the door to the classroom, and there's nothing there. There's nothing in this, there's not a desk, there's no paper, there's no pencils, there are no textbooks. And I said to myself, what am I going to do? I've got all these kids ready to learn. I'm supposed to teach this alternative education program, and I have zero to start with. So I did what any um, young man would do. I called my mom. And <laughs> I, said, I said, Mom, what am I going to do? Long story short, Mom rode to the rescue, and, and she told me what mothers tell their sons when their sons find themselves in a pinch. She said, you need to call your father. <laughs> I called my father, and long story short, the, uh, my dad was good friends with the maintenance director of the school. They showed up with some cleaning supplies, and I, I put my 21 alternative education students to work cleaning the house that the school had rented for us to, uh, to use as, al as our alternative education site. At the end of the day, the program, not, not that day, but at the end of the, my time there, the program was recognized by the Michigan Alternative Education Association as one of the outstanding programs in the state, and I was recognized one year as their outstanding educator of the year, which was a very humbling experience because I, I, I didn't consider myself that at the time. I moved from alternative education to the high school where I taught for two years. And at the, end of te at the end of my teaching time there, I became the assistant principal at the high school, from the assistant principal at the high school to Midland Public Schools, which was a huge, a huge step for me. In fact, when I was over in the conference room next door, that's where I interviewed for the assistant principal of Central Middle School. So a lot of memories came flooding back standing there. So I was the assistant principal at Central Middle School with Gary Verindy as the principal. It was a wonderful experience, one of the best of my life. And I'm not saying that because I'm interviewing in front of you. It truly was one of the best educational experiences of my life being at Central Middle School. I didn't see myself as a middle school guy when I went there. And when I left, I saw myself as only a middle school guy. So it was truly a life-changing experience in that, in that building. From Central Middle School to Midland High School for a year under Mike Frizee as the assistant principal there. Learned a tremendous amount from Mike and a tremendous amount about a high school, especially one of that size and the scope of the programs that are offered for these students. From there to Gladwin as their superintendent where I've been for the past eight years and now here with you tonight. So that's, that's sort of a longer version, I guess, of, of, um, of where I come from. In Gladwin, something that uh, is, is perhaps my, um, my best accomplishment to date is changing, and I'll talk more about this later in the interview as I answer other questions, but we truly have, we've, we've truly achieved a renaissance of that district. We have changed its culture completely. And in doing so, we've improved every facet of the district from student achievement, most importantly, to the, phys to the physical plant, to the physical status of the district financially, and then, and then certainly um, moving forward with academics, again, our, our biggest focus. Thank you. I think I got them all, Jerry. Great. And we're going to get to some of those examples real quick <coughs> right. with Lynn's first question. Ready? All right, Rick, please describe your leadership and communication style, how you make decisions and resolve conflicts, work with your executive team, administrators, staff, board of ed, and move the organization forward. Give us an example of a complex problem you faced and the process you used to resolve it. I know that's a long question, so if you need anything repeated, I'd be happy to do All that. All right. Well, help me out if I, if I miss anything. All righty. Um, of course, I anticipated the question in your leadership style. That's one that I would assume that any Board of Education would want to know first and foremost about a candidate. 
And I've, I've had many, many, many graduate classes that have talked about leadership, and you can put leaders in lots of different boxes, and there are lots of different names for the types of leaders that are out there. Um, I'm not sure I fit in any one of those boxes. So what I did today is, in anticipation of the question, is I, I went out and sought out some of the teachers in Gladwin, some that are um, very close to me and I, I would consider confidants in situations, and some that, quite frankly, we, we maybe don't agree all the time. And I asked them that question. I said, yeah, what, what kind of a leader would you, would you categorize me as? I didn't know what I was going to get from everybody, but uh, I, I wanted to hear their, their input because I suppose they would have the best view on it, uh, a better view anyway, certainly, than maybe I do. And there was a common theme, and the common theme was that I'm visionary. That Every single person that I talked to said that, that I, Rick, you're, you're just a visionary leader. And you have a unique talent of being able to inspire other people to want to reach that vision. One of the teachers told me, and this, this really um, struck me, and, and it made me feel really good. One of the teachers said, Rick, you have a way of getting people to perform at a level that they don't really expect of themselves. So as, as, far, as, my, as far as my leadership um, style, that probably spells it out better than any theory that I could quote from a textbook that I was forced to read in a, in a graduate school classroom. Uh, when I solve problems, um, or when I communicate probably, I think that was the next part of your question is my communication <laughs> style. I believe, I'm very comfortable with all the different forms of media that people use nowadays, everything from Twitter and Facebook and, and some of them that haven't even been named yet. I'm very comfortable with those types of media, but I really believe that the most important tool that a superintendent has when they're trying to communicate with the stakeholders in the district are their shoes. I really believe that. You've got to get out and see people. You have to be visible. You have to talk to them. Sometimes you're not going to want to hear what people have to say because it, it, can be, it can be hurtful. But it's real, and it's part of the job. And I believe that being visible, wearing a pair of shoes out a year at least, is the way that you can most um, effectively communicate with people. It's that one-to-one -one communication that I believe means the most, because that's how you build relationships, and true communication is really about those relationships. So communicating, I wear out my shoes. Uh, that, that's my number one tool. But I am very comfortable with all of the different types of media, everything from email, like I said, to the social media feeds that are out there. Um, that are out there today. Solving problems and, and resolving conflict. I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example of, um, of a quick, of a quick um, issue that we faced in Gladwin right off the bat when I, when I got there, and it was a staffing issue. And again, I remember, it takes me back to my Midland Public School days, and I remember when we um, cleared these rooms and had them set up for staffing. Joe Schmidt was the Director of Human Resources at the time. And I remember these staffing meetings where we sat there and we sorted out where everybody was going to end up in the district, and it was so complicated. And as a, as a young assistant principal, just being here from Gladwin, it seemed way too complicated for me, and I, and I didn't understand it. But over the years here, I came to understand it very well and see the patterns that developed from that. We sat down in Gladwin and we said, we have to make some staffing changes here. And when I say we, I sat down with the administrative team that we have. And that's one of the things that I think is very important when you're talking about resolving conflict, or we're talking about involving your administrators, and it, it, it applies here very well. There are a lot of administrators in Midland compared to what I have in Gladwin, without a doubt. The brain trust here is enormous. The, the various administrators that you have, everybody from department heads um, to, the, to the directors, certainly, to the principals and assistant principals in the building, they're bright people. If they weren't, they wouldn't be in the positions that they are. So they can serve as a treasure trove, really, for a superintendent of information, of ideas, of solutions to problems that are out there. When we did our staffing, when we looked for solutions with our staffing issues, there was some conflict because building principals traditionally want to protect what they have. And that's a good thing, that they own those folks, they own what's happening in that building, and they want to protect it the way it is because they have an affinity for it. But as the superintendent, as I'm pushing back on that, looking for ways to adjust staffing to frankly save money, we had some conflicts that we had to resolve. Those conflicts were resolved one way, and it was through trust. I had to garner their trust. They had to believe that what we were doing was going to work out, and it was going to put us in a better place. And I had to ask them, because I was new, I had to ask them to trust me. And I, and I told them, if you will, if you'll extend that trust, that unconditional trust right now, before I quite frankly may have earned it, I'll live up to it. And we did that, and it worked out, and, and we changed some things for the better. I think I got all of the questions. 
follow-ups? <clears throat> if not, we'll move on to Yvonne. Describe your 90-day plan for entering the district. <clears throat> Please give specific examples of what you would do. I would break it down uh, into three parts. The first part that I would that I would look at, and I would look at all three of these concurrently. They wouldn't happen in step. But I would look at, first of all, establishing a relationship with all of the different stakeholders, from the business community, um, the foundations, the teaching staff, the support staff, everybody within the organization itself, everybody outside of the organization, and within the organization, and perhaps, most importantly, the students themselves. They're important. They're why we're here. Mike Prezee taught me that at Midland High, those of you that know Mike. Mike made it a condition of my employment as the assistant principal there at Midland High that I better know the vast majority of those kids. And I made it my mission to do that. And I think it's important because they like to talk. And they have great information. And they're bright kids. So I would, I would go out as, as part one of that is I, was engaged, I would engage those stakeholders. I would communicate with them. I would start to build a relationship with everyone involved in the hopes of using that relationship down the road to make the district better. What I would be doing at the same time would be working with the same stakeholders and working with the board to try to establish what the most immediate issues facing the district are. Because your immediate issues, that I hope become my immediate issues, don't wait for your 90-day plan to be over with. Whatever the burning issues are for Midland Public Schools, they don't wait for 90 days to end before they pop up and say, okay, solve us now. Your 90-day plan has been implemented. Good job. So there are going to be things that have to be taken on right away, and you have to be prepared for those, so you have to find out what they are. And again, you work with the Board of Education and the various stakeholders inside and outside the district to do that. The third piece is building a plan for the future. You have to start doing that immediately because it doesn't happen overnight. Building a strategic plan that ultimately results in a vision that drives the district forward to a new and better place doesn't happen in, in a month or two months or 90 days. It takes some time to do that. It takes some time to get the support necessary for change. Everyone knows, and we've heard it a thousand times, that change is uncomfortable. And as a result, there's often resistance to it. So you have to work early on in the process to develop the need for change, to raise the awareness of the need for change, so that it, there isn't as much resistance at the end of the day. So those three things would have to happen concurrently in a 90-day plan. It's very ambitious to do that, um, but, it, but it can be done. Any follow-ups? <coughs> I have a quick follow-up for you on that one. Um, as you talked earlier, you talked about changing the culture and the renaissance at Gladwin. Uh, obviously, you talked here about building a strategic plan and taking time and, and overcome resistance to change. Can you talk about the process you went through there a little bit? I can. I, I stole it. Um, I, I took it from Dr. Um, Dick Galinsky. <laughs> it, don't tell him. <laughs> if you're watching, <laughs> um, at least I've given him credit for it. Uh, he, when I was here, he... He worked through a strategic planning process with the board and the district at that time. And I took bits and pieces of what he did and tucked it away. And then when it came my time as the superintendent to do that very same type of process, I used some of the very same things that I learned from watching him go through that strategic, strategic planning process here. That, so that's what I did. It wasn't exactly what he did, but I took away bits and pieces of it that I thought worked very well here and implemented it there. It, it didn't happen overnight again. It was a long process, but it involved many, many people weighing in on what they thought the district should look like moving forward. What was your biggest point of resistance, and how did you work on that? Financial information or uh, financial changes that needed to happen. Gladwin Community Schools at the time uh, was spending about 91% of its total operating budget on, on wages and benefits. You know from looking at your district audit that that's unsustainable. And, and, and it, by anybody's estimation, that's, un, that's an unsustainable model. That needed to change. Well, that type of change impacts people personally. And when you impact people personally, there's tremendous resistance. And that was the biggest piece of it, Jerry. And, and it was very difficult, uh, but we worked through it. We, we worked through it very transparently and very trustingly. At the end of the day, I'm not, it wasn't all roses. Okay, the solutions that needed to come from that you know, were, were difficult to implement. But at the end of the day, because of the way that we did it, we walked away understanding one another and the need for those changes. So we healed very quickly and moved on with the business of educating kids. Thank you. Any follow-ups? I'll turn it to John. Okay. Um, describe the optimal relationship between the board and the superintendent. Discuss a time when you needed to advise a board 
that may have overstepped their policy making boundaries and infringed on your role as an administrator. Specifically, how did you manage this? Very carefully. <laughs> um, the, the board serves a very important function, especially in the development, implementation, and oversight of policy. You all know that. Any, any board that's been through any sort of board training um, has had that over and over and over again. There was, there was a situation that, um, that we had in Gladwin, relatively new in my tenure as superintendent, where a board member had um, heard a rumor uh, about a particular staff member and had gone out and um, started to conduct their own investigation into um, the alleged behavior. And obviously there are a lot of legal consequences um, in play there and there are also some political consequences certainly in play as well. Sitting down and speaking to that board member about that and why that's not an appropriate way to, to conduct business was a tough thing for me to do, especially new in my tenure. It wasn't that I didn't have five or six years under my belt um, at the time that that, that happened. But actually it happened, something similar happened twice in my tenure, once, um, once more recently. And it, you know, it's just a matter of if you've, if you've developed a relationship with the board, if you've worked together to trust one another, you can have those frank conversations that aren't personal. And that's the key. It's not personal. We're conducting business. And we're conducting business that impacts people's lives, people that work here and people that we educate here. We have to be able to have those frank conversations without walking away feeling personally wounded. And in order to do that, you just have to be upfront about it. And I use a communication style, it's called care fronting. And I learned it a long time ago when I was working with alternative education kids. And when you're doing that, you talk about what's good in the situation first, you talk about what's bad in the situation and needs to change, and then you talk about how those changes made me feel, and then I give you the opportunity to talk about how it makes you feel. And through that process, you take the personal animosity away from it, and it just, it frankly then becomes business. And we can deal with business issues if we keep the, the emotion, the personal emotion out of it. It's easier said than done. Mm -hmm. sure. How did it work out? It worked out fantabulous. <laughs> <laughs> it really did. It worked out great. Um, one, one situation worked out great. The other situation, um, not as great. But it ended up with an outcome that everybody could live with. We'll move it on to Kim. Uh, describe your experience with collective bargaining negotiations. What strategies can be used to promote collaborative relationships and bargaining difficult issues? The, in, in Gladwin as a superintendent, I have acted as the district's chief bargainer on all of the contracts that, that we have negotiated. In eight years, um, I've negotiated 15, maybe more, um, contracts with our various labor groups. I'm famous for one-year agreements. Um, I believe that in this economic climate and in this legislative climate, one-year agreements serve the district best. Now, that means you spend a lot of time at the bargaining table. It doesn't have to be a bad thing. Um, <coughs> the, there's lots of different uh, techniques for bargaining that are out there. There's interest-based bargaining and the training that goes along with it, and I've been, and I've been through that. There's win-win bargaining. That's another form that's been pushed from time to time, very similar to interest-based bargaining, but uses a little bit different approach to get to the end. But the reality is, it, it doesn't matter, uh, and maybe that's not what you want to hear, but it really doesn't. It doesn't matter what name you put on the technique you're using to bargain a contract with the labor group. What matters is do both sides of the table have trust in one another moving forward? And you've heard me say that before with other issues, and I believe it's crucial to leadership, and that's trust. You have to trust one another at the bargaining table. You're going to have differences. You're not going to agree. It's the nature of the process. If you agreed, you wouldn't need to bargain, right? You're not going to agree. But you can trust and you can respect one another's position. It's not a personal battle of wills. If it becomes a personal battle of wills, good luck. It's very difficult to dig out of that. But you can enter the bargaining process a as, um, as an analogy, as a marriage. You're going to disagree, but you've got to get along at the end of the day. You're, you've got to make this work so that you can get the job done, get the business taken care of, so you can move on with what's important, and that's educating kids. I've been involved in contract negotiations that have lasted less than 10 hours, and we've, re and we've, got, and we've gotten a contract. I've also been involved in labor negotiations that have gone on for a year and a half, and we're knocking on the door of impasse. Um, I'm very well versed in the, um, the, bargain the laws relating to bargaining. 
um, whether they're Merck or Para. Um, I'm also very well versed in case law as it relates to that because I've had lots of experience in, in applying those types of things. But even long, protracted, and sometimes contentious negotiations do not have to end badly. If they end badly and there's a bad taste in people's mouth, it takes too long to heal and move on with the, the important job of educating kids. So the key is to build that trust and transparency. I'll give you an example of how we did that. What we did is we said, here's what we're going to do, and I'm going to use insurance as an example. We wanted to put in place a hard insurance cap before hard caps were the legislative requirement. We wanted to put that in place, and the board was 100% behind it. It was something we felt we needed to do. Again, 91% of our budget was consumed by wages and benefits. We knew we had to solve the problem in part at the bargaining table. So we sat down and we said, there's going to be a hard cap. We really need to bargain this. Well, you can imagine that the, the labor union, the teachers union, didn't jump up and down and say, you know, that's a great idea, Rick. Why didn't we think of that? Let's do it. It didn't happen that way. And we knew that was going to happen. So I sat down with the union president, the chief negotiator, and I said, look, here's what we're going to do. This is the issue that's in front of us, the cost of health care. The district will pay for an insurance consultant of your choosing. You choose who you feel comfortable with. The district will cover the cost, 100% of the cost. We'll bring that person in. We'll move through a process together where we explore what options are available to us that could provide you with a level of coverage you're comfortable with but at the same time save the target dollars that the district needs to, to save. They were in Mesa at the time. I, in fact, I believe that they were still in Mesa Supercare at the time. And we sat down with this. They, they picked a person. The district paid them. We sat down. We went through a process. I would like to tell you that it went swimmingly, and the, the consultant brought to the, brought to the table this great package that everybody could live with. And we signed the contract and lived happily ever after. That didn't happen. Um, it, was, it was very difficult. Moving away from the comfort of Mesa Insurance was something that was just beyond the scope of our teachers at the time. So we struggled with that for about a year and a half. We were set to impose it if necessary, but we sat down one last time and we, and we said, look, we don't, we're not looking to damage relationships here. In the meantime, I did something that was crucial to settling that contract, and that is I changed my personal health care and my family's personal health care away from Mesa and into a Blue Cross Blue Shield plan. I did that a year <coughs> ahead of time so that I could come to them and say, look, I'm still here. You know, it's not a box of Band-Aids and a tourniquet. It works very well. And, and there was some trust that was inherent to that decision on my part. Well, you know what? If Rick did it, for him and his family, and remember, I've got a wife in, in, at that time, so two little kids running around. If it was okay for Rick, it might be okay for us to explore this. And they said they would. We, we we settled the contract with the hard cap in place. A year later, our teacher group uh, moved out of Mesa Insurance, and we are now insured by Priority Health, and it's gone, it's gone very well. Now, you said that you, the administration switched over to Blue Cross Blue Shield, mm -hmm. or was it just you? It was, all, it was all the administrators. Yep, good point. Yep, it was all the administrators. I was able to convince them that it was important we all do it together. And did uh, administration take a salary cut at all over the last five years? No, nope, we haven't had um, we haven't had to do that with any of our um, with any of our labor groups. We have not had to reduce Excellent. salaries. We've had to hold them in check, but we haven't had to reduce them. Great. Thank you. Any other follow ups? Angela. All right. Tell us about one area in your district district budget that you have had to trim or modify due to budget constraints. And how was that decision reached, and who was involved in the decision-making process? Okay. Uh, I'm going to stick with, there's a bunch. Um, when, when I got to Gladwin, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the, uh, the nutshell <coughs> version of the budget story. When I, when I got to Gladwin, one of the first meetings that I, that I had was with the, the business director, Julie Shear, great lady and an incredible business director. Excuse me. I sat down with Julie, and I said, hey, I, need to talk about, uh, I need to talk about finances in the district. I need to get a, a handle on where we're at. And when I had interviewed, I, I had been told that things were, were pretty good financially. The look on her face when I asked her that question was priceless, and it wasn't a good look. <laughs> As it turns out, the district was nearly bankrupt. Um, their fund equity was depleted to less than $300,000. And of that $300,000, there, there was no liquid, at, there were no liquid assets that could be used for, for anything. It was big trouble. It, we were looking at um, needing to make payroll through the summer. We really needed to consider borrowing $4 million to make that happen. At a time when we didn't have, we, we didn't have the, um, 
the collateral, if you will, to borrow that kind of money. The district was hurting financially in a, in a big way. When we, when we realized that that was where we stood, it became very important to educate the community that hadn't been educated about the problem. There were going to be some big changes. And it's very hard for me to talk about one area of the budget that was cut because we had to cut them all. But it became very important for us to go out and educate the community on why they were going to see some of these things happen to their school district. Why were we going to have to lay off 20% of the entire school workforce? Why were we going to have to change the way that things were structured with some of our non-instructional services? Because we couldn't go out, I didn't feel, we could go out and make those types of of changes without the community being educated as far as what the need was, without the school community being educated as far as what the need for the change was. And I believe that that's how you avoid resistance to change is education up front. Teach people why there needs to be change before you go ahead and just implement change. You'll have a lot less resistance. It won't eliminate it, but you'll have a lot less. So we did that. We went out, I created a PowerPoint presentation about the entire state of the school district. And the only thing I didn't include in that PowerPoint presentation at the time, I did later, was the academic issues that were out there. And I'll, I'll talk about those later. But I included the financial issues and the physical plant issues in this PowerPoint. I took, it, I took it on the road. I went everywhere. If I could get in front of a group of it, didn't matter how many people with my PowerPoint, I did it. We, w we went to church groups, Chamber of Commerce, Kiwanis, Rotary, the Red Hat Society. That was a hoot. The, I mean, I went and talked to anybody that would let me set up my little screen and show my PowerPoint about the status of Gladwin Community Schools. After I had done that, and I had a goal, I wanted to reach out to as many people as I could, and I thought if I could get out to just over a thousand folks, and they would tell, if each of them told two people, in a community the size of Gladwin, I could reach a lot of people that way. I went to every single township meeting, spoke to all the people that come to those. They're pretty well attended in Gladwin, so I was able to reach out to a lot of people through those township meetings. At the end of the day, the community was very well educated in the need for change, and they supported the need for change um, very well, including the school community. Not to say it was painless. It wasn't. It was incredibly painful. But they understood the need for that change, and that's, that's how we did it. Now, if I were to give you a specific example, it would have to be staffing. Um, we went through a period of time in two years when we, when we actually did reduce the district staff by just a little over 20%. You can imagine the pain that was inherent to that. I can speak to it personally because I made it my personal, uh, my personal mission, if you will, that every single person who lost their job sat down and talked with me personally. I delivered the news. I sat down with them one-on-one -on -one and talked to them about the need for their layoff um, and, and how I would work diligently to get them back as quickly as I could. Those were very emotional conversations. You can imagine when you're sitting down one-on-one -on -one with an individual who you are taking away their ability to provide for their family. But I felt it important that I do that. One of the people that um, I had that meeting with was my sister. And my sister was laid off for over three years before we were able to get her back. Um, so I was, I was personally, and my family was personally touched by the decisions that I was making um, to, to bring in, to bring our budget into alignment in the staffing area. Thank you. Well, <coughs> any any follow-up? Did you have to close any buildings? <coughs> we did not. We, we have four buildings in Gladwin. We have the junior high, the high school, um, our intermediate school, which is grades three, five, and our elementary school, grades pre-K through second grade. We have one outbuilding, which is our alternative education site. We've kept them all open. What's the building capacity at the various buildings? Well, it depends on how tightly you stack them. Um, we, we probably 600 in our kindergarten, or in our elementary and intermediate school, um, junior high, kids, Probably you say 80% full, above 50% full? We're 80% full, okay. yeah. We're 80% we're full now, yep. Any others? Let's move on to Scott. All right. Uh, given our economic climate, how do you set fiscal priorities regarding uh, the allocation of resources needed to educate children? With the board. OK. Um, the board represents the community. You're elected by the community. And um, you hear from them about what their priorities are. I'll tell you what we did in Gladwin is a specific example. We obviously had to, to go through that process in a, in a big way. Um, I should tell you that we, we now have a very healthy fund balance. Um, we went from being um, all but bankrupt to, I believe, right now operating with about a 15, 16% fund balance. So we're, we're very healthy. 
um, in operating a budget that is, is very close to being balanced unless we decide to use some of our fund equity to purchase things like buses or um, curriculum needs that we may have. So we, we did a really good job of, of bringing things um, into alignment. Um, do, me, do me a favor, if, if you could, Scott, and sure. repeat it for me so I make sure I get, it, <coughs> get exactly what you're after. Yeah, the question was centered around setting fiscal priorities uh, in terms of educating or allocating resources. What we did is we sat down and we looked at every place we spend money. And I, and I created or I had um, the um, accounts payable folks in the, in the um, business director create a binder for me, for the board, for the administrators of every dime that was spent. You can imagine this. It wasn't one binder. You can imagine the size of the information that we, that we had. And I wanted it in hard copy form. I wanted people to see the enormity of it. And what I charged our, our administrative staff with, I said, let's go through this. Let's go through this and find out where we spend money. And then I want to listen to you. Because you're going to tell me, you live with this stuff. You know. I mean, I'm in my office, and I'm learning about it, and I'm studying it, and I'm looking at the data. But you're living with it. I want to hear from you where you think we could rearrange some of our priorities. And I'm going to convey that information back to the board. And I did the same thing with the board. I went through the board with where do we spend our money. Once we looked at where we spent it, then we went out. And this was crucial, and this is a big part of it. I'm a very data-driven individual. I like to look at information because in that information is a story, and in the story is the answer to whatever problems you face. I really believe that. Information really does tell the story. But I'm a science guy, so you have to understand that that's just the way that, that I'm wired. But we sat down and we said, all right, let's take a look at where this money is being spent, and let's evaluate it. Let's evaluate these expenditures. For example, if we're spending I'm going to throw a number out there. If we're spending $700,000 on Reading First initiatives in our elementary school, what are the results that we're getting? And can we show those results to the Board of Education and the community at large? And if we can't show them those results, our information is anecdotal and maybe doesn't hold enough water to keep that program around. Maybe it does, but maybe it doesn't. So we investigated all of our expenditures. Now, we didn't investigate the cost of pencils, obviously. We didn't get into that kind of minutia. But when we looked at our budget, we did study everything we spend money on in any substantial way, and we looked for the data to support the expenditure of those dollars. Were those dollars resulting in increases in student achievement in some way, shape, and form? If they weren't, we looked at whether or not we needed to spend the money on that. Very time-consuming process, but we involved our administrative staff in doing that. I believe they've got a dog in that hunt, certainly. Again, they have to live with the changes in those buildings, and I wanted them to be part of the process. Thank you. Follow-ups? Oh, do you have an <coughs> example of a program that you guys ended up cutting that would have been a surprise? You know, something that the mm. community might have said, you know, like you gave that reading example. Yeah. You know, wow. We didn't cut how, that can, one. how can you know, how can we cut something like that where yeah. you found the benefit wasn't what common perception would have been? think of some of the ones that we ended up that we ended up reducing one of the things that we there was one that we changed and it, we had we had offered math to a certain um, a certain pattern that, that kids went through and we made a major change in the way that we did that that the, that allowed us to decrease some staffing at the junior high level and that was a big surprise um, it's turned out very well um, we went to a more integrated math approach as kids left the junior high and went into the high school so that was a pretty big surprise and one that that people probably didn't see coming through that whole process How about the other way? Um, maybe it's all of them by definition, but what stuck out is, oh, we really need to keep this and rise in priority. Curriculum coaches, without a doubt, jumped off the paper and screamed at us that it was one of the most important things we were doing. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Any others? I guess it's back to me. Uh, can you give us a practical example of what 21st century learning that incorporates technology looks like? Uh, either what you've implemented or what you envision. Well, we've done some implementation of some technology pieces in Gladwin um, as far as instructional technology for teachers to use. But you're all on the edge of your seats tonight because, because you're, you're waiting to hear from the polls um, how well the technology bond and the sinking fund are doing. So let me stick with that one um, <laughs> a little bit. The, the, uh, when the technology bond passes and um, you move down the road of implementing the things that, that you're putting in place uh, with, with that 
with that program. You're really moving into the 21st century as far as learning is concerned. When you talk about putting a personal computing device in the hands of every single student and sending that device home, I mean, that's exciting stuff. I mean, that, that's game-changing stuff that you're talking about doing there. When you, when you do that, that's 21st century learning. But, but I want to talk about the implementation of that a, a little bit, if I can. When you, when you look at doing that, it's, it's so important. And I, know you, and I know Gary Verlindi very well, and I know he's working on this project, so I know these are things that are already happening. But I want you to understand that I see it as well. It's so important that you get beyond the tool. It's so important that you get beyond the iPad, or you've got to get beyond the, the, the Galaxy tablet, or whatever it is that you put in the hands of those kids, or whatever it is that you put in the hands of the teacher. It's not about the tool. It's about how that tool engages learners. And you have to make sure that there's a plan, and I know there is. I know, how, I know how things go in Midland Public Schools, so I know there's a plan. I know there's a well-thought-out plan. But you've got to make sure that that technology engages kids. In, in order to do that, you have to make sure people are trained. Teachers are trained? Absolutely. But there's a piece of this that can't go overlooked, and that is training the parents. Many of our parents ask their five-year-old, and I'm one of them. I don't have a five-year-old, so I would ask my eight-year-old daughter now. Remember, she's the one going on 21. If I can't program the VCR, I ask my daughter to do it. If I have a problem with my iPhone or my Kindle, I ask my daughter to do it. Our kids understand these things at a level beyond where many of us do. So we have to make sure that we reach out, I believe, we have to make sure that we reach out to the parents. If we're truly going to use these devices to extend the learning day into the home, we better have a way to support the parents in doing that with us. And many parents will do it. The younger parents, certainly, they'll jump onto these things and it will happen for them. But for parents that are my age, it may not happen that easily. And they may need some support. And I believe, this, I believe that Midland Public Schools should provide that support for those parents. If we're going to move into the 21st century and we're going to turn the school day into a, a school life, then we need to support the parents as well. That's a quick example. <clears throat> I, I wanted to use yours because I know you're all anxiously waiting to hear what's going to happen. And that was a good example. Any other follow-up to that? W what type of support would you envision in terms of MPS offering to the parents? I came up with a name for it. When I met with the search firm, that was a qu we talked about that a little bit. And, and uh, we, came up with a, we came up with a name for it, or I did. And I told them that if, if uh, somebody else gets the job, that it's copyrighted. So don't let anybody <laughs> else use my name. Um, it, 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 would be, um, it would be technology home liaisons people that would actually work with the parents that would, that would perhaps even travel to the home. I know that's scary, you know, how are we going to do that? But let's face it, if we tell our parents, hey, come on in, let's have a meeting and we're going to show you how to use these things, probably the people that need the guidance the most aren't going to be able to do that. And not because they don't care. They're working. They're busy. So let's go to them. And let's use uh, the Rick Seebeck uh, technology liaison folks to go out and do that. That's just an off-the-wall example of something that I thought up. Um, but I think it has some merit to consider. Thank you. Yeah. What 21st century learning skills uh, would you expect uh, to be aided or built with the technology piece? Well, certainly there's the curriculum piece um, that would be in the support of the curriculum and engaging the kids in the curriculum. Mm -hmm. But there's a bigger piece, I think, than that. When we look in, in the International Baccalaureate Program goes this way, 21st century learning framework goes this way, how do we use this tool to take a student who, up to this point perhaps, has been engaged in relatively traditional education, we teach it, you learn it, we test it, see how you did, right? But we've got to turn those kids into less um, regurgitators of information and more into users of information, perhaps even on a global scale, and that's where IB and 21st century learning framework comes in. How can they use that information to, to solve problems? And as they get older and move through our curriculum, how do they solve those problems on a global or a world scale? Technology does that. I mean, it shrunk the world. Remember the book that was out um, uh, a long time ago that, that talked about how the world had, had really shrunk with the advent of technology? Well, it has. And if we're going to put these technology tools in the hands of kids, it's going to shrink their world. But it can turn relatively young students into global problem solvers. And I think that that's a big piece that we'll have to look at as we move forward. But again, it ties so well into the IB program that is already in place at the, at the diploma level here mm -hmm. um, in Midland. And I know that you guys are looking at um, next year moving into the, um, the, the uh, primary. primary IB program. Yeah. Yeah. So in doing that, I mean, it's all set up. The pieces are in place to, to make that happen. And you'll have the tools after tonight, we hope. <laughs> 
Rick, I'll do a follow-up. Uh, any knowledge of new tech and those kind of approaches smell very much like what you're speaking of. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any firsthand knowledge? And what have you done in Gladwin? Two questions, actually. What have you done in Gladwin towards this 21st century? We, we've started down the path in the classrooms right now. We, we haven't been able to get the financial resources necessary to go out with the personal computing devices in the hands of all the kids yet. So we're doing it in the classroom. And what we did, when I started in Gladwin, the teachers were still ordering white chalk and writing on green boards. When we got whiteboards, we thought we entered the 21st century. Not so. Um, we, so what we've been doing is putting the, the uh, smart technology classroom suites in, the smart boards, or, or the equivalent to those types of things, and the professional development for the teachers to learn how to use those effectively. Let's face it, if you don't teach the teachers how to use the tool, a smart board is a $5,428 whiteboard. Mm -hmm. And we wanted, not, we wanted that not to happen. So specific to Gladwin, Jerry, that's where we're at with things right now as far as the implementation of 21st century type learning, as far as the tools go. But again, don't get lost in the tool. It's more important with how that tool is used by the educators and the kids to extend their learning. New tech is a, is a different animal. I admittedly don't know a lot about new tech, so what I did is, is I contacted John Guajanka, um, and I, I visited Sanford Meridian. I spent some time over there and toured their new tech program and talked to their director and talked to John about what new tech is, how it works. In, and we, again, without the financial resources to support going that direction, although there's definitely value in it, and, and converting Central into a new tech school I think is going to be fascinating. But in talking with John and in talking with the director there, a piece that I took away from it was teaching the kids, again, to be problem solvers with information. And that's huge. And I think that that's a direction that I'm going to take Gladwin in if I don't end up here in Midland, is using what we can afford to teach kids to be problem solvers not just problem solvers 1 through 20, the odd, in the, at the end of the chapter, but problem solvers on a global perspective. Thank you. Any others? Let's turn it over to Lynn. All righty. Rick, share any experience you may have in establishing equity for children with differing needs, implementing the RTI model, and developing and evaluating gifted and talented programs. What we've done in Gladwin is we took a look at you initially using the RTI model to address the, the students that we suspected may have had some sort of learning disability that was preventing them from being successful. And what we found in going through that process was this RTI model can apply to everybody. It can even apply to the gifted and talented kids. Because regardless of who the student is, if their needs aren't being met, you've got to address it. And RTI can address it both on the, the, the possibility for special needs or on the possibility of a child's need for an extended curriculum. And what we discovered in doing that, it was really exciting because it was a totally unanticipated outcome of the RTI model. When we started, it was just to address special education. It was to get those systemic interventions in place so that we could try to help these kids before there needed to be a referral made and ultimately some sort of a special education label placed on, on that child. So that's how we started it. But what we found out is, holy cow, this works for everybody. If we've got a student that is really struggling to get beyond where they're at because we're, quite frankly, holding them back, we bottled them up into the curriculum that we have in place, how can we apply systemic interventions, meaning immediate, meaning they don't need the permission of somebody. They happen. When the teacher in the classroom with the student recognizes the need, they can systemically react to it. And what we found was that we could put in place, and what we did is we put in place an intervention period at our junior high, and we put an intervention period in place at our high school where students that have the learning disability needs, they can get their help. If they don't have a learning disability but are still struggling at any point in the curriculum, they can get their needs met by moving to the teachers that are best suited to help them. And again, that happens systemically. It just it automatically happens. On the same token, if we see a student or a group of students who need to be pushed, who are who are perhaps gifted, perhaps talented. Maybe they're gifted and talented only in this particular thing that we're working on. It doesn't have to be gifted and talented in everything or all year. It might just be on this one topic. How do we push them? And again, we set up interventions so those kids could move into those systemically and get pushed beyond where they may have been otherwise. So we found the RTI model worked pretty well for everybody. And it has worked very well for everybody. One of the best, more concrete examples for you is that our junior high, we discovered that we were missing a lot of the um, a lot of the glicks at the time. We're moving away from glicks now to Common Core, but the glicks at the time we were missing a lot of those glicks in the way we had our math paradigm set up in the building. 
So we, when we looked at that, we said we have got to make sure that we touch on all of these content standards with every kid. What we were doing is we were taking the kids that were doing very well, we were accelerating them, and as a result, they were missing content standards that they, they desperately needed when it came time for them to take the MEEP test or ultimately the ACT. So we took all those kids that were being pushed along and we moved them back into the traditional eighth grade math curriculum. Well, it worked swimmingly for a while. And then it, the kids started to get antsy. They were beyond that. Then we set up the intervention. And we said, kids that are moving beyond that, and maybe they're moving beyond it in just this one particular concept that we're teaching. But let's move them beyond it for that particular concept. And then if they struggle a little bit, we'll bring them back. So our model of, of addressing the needs of all kids, regardless of where they're at, allows for that flexibility in and out of those inter interventions as necessary and systemically. Rick, if I called your teachers tomorrow that are doing that, how would they tell me it's working? It would depend on who you called. <laughs> <laughs> Can I, I'll give you a list. <laughs> uh, it, it depends. It, it's a stretch. If you can imagine from a teacher's perspective, having your intervention time changing all the time. This group of kids is coming in because they're not getting um, the, a novel that we're working on. They're not making the connection of a particular novel that we're, that we're teaching them. And we're going to get some extra time with those kids to help them make that connection. right? But then in a week or two, it might be a different group of kids because they're not getting something else that we're teaching in English at the time. And the kids that were in there before may have moved on and are getting whatever it is that we're teaching now just fine. And that really happens. Not every student that's doing well today grasps every concept every time we teach it. Sometimes even our brightest kids struggle. And we have to be prepared to deal with that when it happens. So if you call the teacher, some of them would say, it's going very well. I've adapted very well to being able to do that. Other teachers would say, this is a struggle. Having this intervention thing changing all the time and being a very fluid and very dynamic environment is a stretch for me. But that's where I come in, and that's where my administrative team comes in. How do we support you? How do we get you the support that you need to get past where you're at right now? And I would hope they would tell you that, and I think they would. Thank you. Any other follow-up? I think we're to Yvonne. Describe your knowledge and any specific experience you may have had in implementing and evaluating IB programs. We don't have an IB program in Gladwin. Financially, we're just we're just not there. So I don't have a lot of a lot of experience with that program. I will tell you I've done a lot of research on it because I, when I was here um, as the principal at Midland High, was, that was when Midland Public Schools was starting down the road of IB. And I was involved in that process at the very beginning, but left before it was, before it was implemented. So what my knowledge of, of the IB program is contained in what I could learn from studying it um, online and from talking to others who are working in schools, world schools even, that have implemented it. I do have to tell you that I find it fascinating. And not, again, not from just the, the pure curriculum side of things, because curriculum, uh, curriculum is, is set and we teach it. But I, I'm absolutely fascinated by how you can take that curriculum. And with IB, for example, the, the three core pieces of that uh, um, theory of knowledge, uh, I mean, how you take the curriculum and then move it through those core areas is fascinating to me. Creativity. Um, being a big part of it. And, and of course, in middle public school, that's a big part of what you do is encourage kids to be creative. So what I've been able to study online fascinates me. But admittedly, because we don't have an international baccalaureate program in Gladwin, I haven't evaluated, I haven't evaluated one. But that's not to say that I wouldn't be capable of it. Um, one of the things that I pride myself in is my ability to learn. And the reason that I am a quick learner is I really don't have a learning ego. If I don't know something, I just tell you I don't know it. And then I'll go out and find out. And there are lots of bright people here at Midland Public Schools that would be more than happy to fill me in. Any other follow-ups? John. What experience have you had in helping a school district develop or modify program priorities? Again, I, I spoke about it earlier. When we had to set our priorities for the district, we studied the data. We looked at what was working and what wasn't working. And we investigated every single thing that we did. A, and a good example is um, a lot of school districts, particularly at the elementary level, use scholastic news as a literature piece for, for students to read. And we do in Gladwin. We, looked, we even looked at something as simple as that. 
what types of learning outcomes are we getting through the use of scholastic news, something as small as that. And if we couldn't show through hard analytical evidence or through perception evidence or perception data that we got from our teachers, our parents, even our kids, then we looked at whether or not that needed to be a priority. So in answer to your question, a very analytical approach to it, mm -hmm. but analytical doesn't just mean numbers. Analytical can mean perceptions as well. And people that look at data and only look at numbers are missing a big part of the story. And as I spoke to earlier, data does tell a story, and in the story is the solution. So when you're looking at those data points, look beyond the numbers. The numbers are important. Again, I'm a science guy. But also look beyond the numbers at the perceptions. And don't forget the kids. Their perceptions are priceless. Thank you. Follow-ups? Move to Kim. Discuss your knowledge and any specific experiences in helping a district measure and report its own progress towards a strategic vision. I think if you talk to the teachers, the board, uh, the community in Gladwin, you would find that they would pro probably call me, maybe they would call me lots of things, but <laughs> they, they would, hopefully they would call me Mr. Accountability because I really believe that there has to be accountability in everything that we do. And that includes the superintendent. The superintendent has to be accountable ultimately for the outcomes that the board sets. So what we do in Gladwin is we hold ourselves to strict accountability. When I recognized, and I'll use curriculum as an example, when I recognized in Gladwin that we were struggling as a district academically, and struggling is probably a mild word for it at the time that, that I got there. We were doing badly. And I stood in front of the teachers, I stood in front of the support staff, I stood in front of the Board of Education at a big meeting, I stood on the stage, and behind me on a humongous screen, I showed them the achievement data of the district over the course of the past five years, and it didn't paint a pretty picture. And I stood there and I asked the question, is this good enough? Is this really good enough for us? And of course the answer was a resounding no, it's not good enough. Then we talked about, okay, what's it going to take to change it? And then how will we know when we did change it? And we set specific benchmarks. We said, this is where we will be. And if we don't get there, we, meaning me too, we will answer for why we didn't get there. Because you're not going to meet every goal. But when you fail to meet a goal, there's a lesson that can be learned and then applied to the next go-round. And that's what we did. That's what we continue to do in Gladwin with everything that we do. Every aspect of our operation is based on setting goals, setting benchmarks, and then actively talking about whether or not we met them, and if we didn't, why not? What happens when you do that, and I talked about cultural revolution in Gladwin, or cultural renaissance in Gladwin, what happens when you do that is every single person suddenly has a dog in the hunt. Every single person starts to take personally their piece of making that work, of reaching that goal. I'll tell you something that happened in a meeting that was powerful, that really got me thinking, we, we're there. We're, we're getting to that cultural revolution that ultimately will drive achievement through the roof in our district. One of the things we do is we have data meetings. And we sit down periodically. We, every quarter, we administer benchmark assessments to our students. We've developed our own assessments that we administer to the kids every quarter to determine whether or not they have learned what we have taught. And then we sit down and we look at the data from those assessments. And it tells us how well did we do. It's not a measure of how well the students do. It's a measure of how well we did. When we sat down in those data meetings and I had the teachers, and one of the things that the principal of the elementary school did at the time is she put the kids' picture next to their score. You want to talk about power, right? So you're the teacher. You're sitting there. We do it together. All of the teachers are sitting in a room having a data meeting, and they're looking on the wall where the principal has posted the data from that benchmark assessment. And all of the teachers can see how their kids did, and, as, and just as importantly, they can see how one another's kids did. And the conversations that come from that initially were tough. And in those meetings, people teared up. People were upset. They were emotional about it. And that's not a bad thing. Because what that said to me is, wow, you are taking it personally. You own the achievement of those kids in your classroom. And when those teachers own that achievement, look out. And that's what happened. And that what, that's, what tur that's when we turned the corner culturally with our academic renaissance there. Every teacher started to own every student's performance. And when that happened, like I said, the top came off. And that's when we really took off as a district. What are your class size policies for the district? We don't have any. Um, we, we, uh, and our contract doesn't speak to them. What, what we do is we, we look at what we think is optimum. 
and what we think we can afford. And unfortunately, what's optimum is not always what you can afford. And that's too bad when that happens. And, it, and it, it's a struggle that boards of education have to deal with and superintendents struggle with all the time. I would love, my wife is a kindergarten teacher, and I would love, so my wife, would love to have kindergarten class sizes 15 or smaller. We can't do it. Financially, there's just no way we could swing it. If I did, I would have to push up third, fourth, and fifth grade class sizes to knocking on the door of 30. That's counterproductive. So there's, unfortunately, there's a balance in there. You have to find that balance of where class sizes, what you'd like to have them, and where you can afford to have them. And do you get the Board of Education report on class sizes across mm -hmm. the district? Oh, yeah. And how often? It depends on how often they ask, at least twice a year. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes people will ask more. And again, one of, my, one of the things that I'm very proud of in the way that I operate is I'm very transparent. Um, I, so if people want to know what is what, we don't hide anything. Um, but we share those types of things with the board uh, very frequently, both in our budget discussions and in our academic discussions. One thing that we found, though, and this is really interesting, one thing that we found is that class sizes, when we, we ran for a while with some very small class sizes, um, and we didn't see huge achievement gains tied to those small class sizes. We saw achievement, ga we saw achievement gains that rivaled small class sizes in some of our medium to upper medium class sizes. What we discovered was it wasn't necessarily how small the class was. What was most important was the commitment of the teacher to engaging the number of kids that they did have. And when our teachers, again going back to my previous story, when our teachers owned that achievement, they were willing to take on a bit bigger class sizes and, and work through it. But again, as I've talked to before, you've got to support people. If class sizes creep up, you've got to provide some support. And support may come in the form of a paraprofessional when you can afford to do that. But what I discovered with class sizes, the support that I, that I think went the furthest was me recognizing the struggle of larger class sizes personally and going to those teachers and saying, I know what you're doing. I know it's tough. The budget's in bad shape. We're going to fix it. We're going to be okay. I need you with me on this. Just acknowledging their angst with that issue went a long way. Anything else? Angela. All right. Tell us about one initiative you are most proud of that you have implemented in your district. What was the largest potential barrier to implementation, and how did you overcome that issue? By far, there's no question. The number one um, accomplishment that I'm most proud of, and I get goosebumps when I talk about it, is our curriculum questions vision. Yeah, it, was, it was a vision that I developed with the help of the building administrators um, that totally changed the district. And we call it our curriculum questions, and it's really quite simple. And I didn't make it up. I, 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 I stole different pieces from all kinds of different places and put it together. What we ask is we ask five questions. And these five questions have to drive everything we do instructionally. We first of all ask, what is it that we should be teaching? When I got to GLAD, when we did a little experiment, we had teachers go through the content standards, whether they were the Glicks or the Huskies, and we had them highlight them with three colors. One color, if you were teaching it to mastery. Another color, if you touched on it but didn't teach it to mastery. And a third color, if you weren't teaching it at all. And we were shocked to find out there were many things that we weren't teaching at all that we needed to. So our first curriculum question, what is it that we should be teaching? The second question is, when do we teach it? Because knowing when you're going to teach it holds you accountable for teaching it. So we built pacing guides. We sat down with our staff. We gave them the time. We, we gave them the training. We gave them the resources. We want you to become intimately familiar with your content standards that you're expected to teach. And we want you to develop a pacing guide that clearly articulates when you're going to teach it. And not just you, but your grade, your department. So every single teacher in a grade level or a department knows what to teach, and they're all teaching it at the same time so they can support one another. Then we say, we, we, we say to them, all right, you know what to teach. You know when to teach it. How do you teach it? What is the pedagogy you use in the classroom? What are your best practices? And what kind of supports can we provide to help you develop your toolbox to have more best practices available for your instruction? What do we teach? When do we teach it? How do we teach it? The next question was, how do we know if the kids learned what we taught? From that, we developed our benchmark assessments, our quarterly assessments that we administer to every kid, every content area, K-12. We administer those, those, those assessments. We have our data meetings to determine how we did as teachers, and we modify our instructional approach based on the results that we get. 
in those benchmark assessments. What's really cool about that is we're moving away from those benchmark assessments being formative. Initially, they were formative assessments. They, they truly gave us a picture of how we might adjust instruction, but they're quarterly. We've gotten to the point now in our culture where those benchmark assessments have become summative. Our formative assessments are happening every single day in the classroom. Our teachers have evolved that far. And it's really neat to watch because I'm not making that happen. It's a, it's a normal evolution of the process. I'd like to take credit for it, but I have to give credit to the teachers who are letting that evolve. So what do we teach? When do we teach it? How do we teach it? How do we know if they learned? And then most importantly, what do we do with the kids that didn't learn it? And what do we do with the students who did and need to be extended? So that's what I'm most pr proud of, is implementing our curriculum questions vision and then ultimately the results that we got. Now I have to tell you, it was the <laughs> scariest thing that I've ever done because I went out on a limb. I developed this, this vision with the help of the board, with the help of the building administrators, with the input of the community through our strategic planning process. I sat down at a picnic table with the building administrators, the principals and assistants. I sat down at a picnic table with them in Traverse City and I said, all right, we were at a retreat. I said, this is what I want to do. And I want you guys to come with me. I want you to buy into this. And it's going to help. It's going to be fantastic. You're going to see incredible growth. You're all going to be famous when this is done, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I don't know if they did it just because they didn't know what else to do if they, or if they humored me. But it didn't matter. They decided that they, would, that they would go along with it. We rolled it out to the staff. I stood in front of them. Big group of people, 300 people in the audience, right? I stood in front of them and I said, this is what we're going to do. And everybody looked at me like I had flowers growing out of my head. <laughs> you know, you're going to what? So when you talk about overcoming obstacles in that, the big obstacle was, really? You know, I mean, a whole, a whole district culture facing you and saying, how do we do this, Rick? And I told him, I said, look, we're going to do, do the three T's. We're going tr to trust one another. We're going we're to talk about this as we do it. And we're going to have teamwork. And I promised them at that time, I said, none of this process is going to be used to evaluate you as a good or a bad teacher. We're going to grow. We're going to grow from where we are to where I believe we can be, and we're going to grow there together. And if you'll trust me, if you'll come with me, you're going to see the results. I promised the Board of Education. I told the board, if I can't get results with this curriculum question vision, fire me. I can't be here. You need curriculum help. You need achievement help. If I can't be the guy to do that, I can't be here. You need to get someone that, that can. I was scared to death because I didn't know if it would work. It didn't at first. You know, we had the first year we did it, nothing changed. The second year we did it, nothing changed. The third year we did it, I went to a conference and they had a, a national speaker from Adlai Stevenson High School who had worked with DeFore on a process very similar to this. That's one of the people that I stole some of this stuff from. And I went to him after the conference and I said, I've been doing this for three years. This is what I'm doing. My whole curriculum question is staying. It's not working. <laughs> and uh, he says to me, he goes, Rick, it's not going to work in three years. He said, do you realize that what happened at Adlai Stevenson Schools happened over a span of 15 years? He said, the reality is you might not be the superintendent when the fruits of your labor are actually picked. And you need to understand that that's possible. I'm thinking, I, need, I can't not be the superintendent. You know, I mean, I need the job. And I promised the board things would change. The board stuck with me on it. And long story short, things started to change in year four. Things really start changing in year five. By year six, things were really going places, and they, are, and they continue to grow. Um, and we've seen just great achievement gains with all levels of our students. It doesn't matter whether they're the students with disabilities, the socioeconomically disadvantaged kids, or the kids that are not socioeconomically disadvantaged. Everybody's showing achievement gains in all content areas. We still have our weak spots, don't get me wrong, but we have a process and a culture in place that will address them. So I'm very proud of that, um, that whole process. Rick, as a follow-up, can you um, talk about some example of uh, scores or metrics that improved? Oh, there's a whole bunch. I wish I'd have brought them. I keep a, again, Dr. Yeah. Data here, no, right? I, mean, I, 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 keep a, I keep a running spreadsheet that doesn't fit on four computer screens. It looks like a NORAD command center when I'm working on this thing. But um, I, as an example, I'll, I'll pick uh, our elementary school. Uh, our elementary school went from being one of the poorest achieving elementary schools in the region. It is now a reward school and a beating the odds school. And when our students leave our elementary school, particularly with reading, um, our highest to date was we sent 95% of our students out of our elementary school reading at grade level. That's pretty phenomenal. 
um, especially considering where we started from and especially considering um, the socioeconomics and demographics of the district within our work. It, that's, that's a fantastic achievement. So that's just one. But Jerry, I could, I could show you the spreadsheet. I'd love to do it, but I don't <laughs> think you want to sit through that. <clears throat> no, thank you. That's the kind of illustration I was looking for. Right. Thank you. Um, I think we're on to, I'm sorry, I lost track of what question we're on. Scott, I believe. Yep. Yeah. And it will be the last question. Okay. Can you tell us why you think you'd be a good fit as a superintendent at Midland Public Schools? And the second part to the question is, what do you think are the most pressing issues facing Midland Public Schools, and how would you begin to address them? When I, when I was here before, I developed an affinity for uh, the school district, and I developed an affinity for Gladden Community Schools when I'm there. I'm the type of guy that throws himself into the job. Um, that's just the way that I'm wired. Um, some people, they used to call me a workaholic. I don't think they do anymore. I think they just call me crazy. But I, I, I do throw myself into the position because I, I believe in an organization, and when I come to believe in an organization and as leader of the organization, I want to see great things happen. I'm, just, I'm, I'm put together that way. When I, when I originally saw the posting for the superintendent's position being vacant here, I looked at it and I considered it, and I, and I stopped there. I really didn't consider it much, much further. And then I took a look at what it was that your focus groups, I got online and I went through what your focus groups had said you were looking for in, in the next superintendent for Midland Public Schools. And as I went through that, it dawned on me, at some point in the PowerPoint, it dawned on me, that's me. They're, they're looking for me. And when I made that realization, that's when I said, oh, I, I have to do this. I, I'm, I'm the fit that they're looking for. I believe that I can do the types of things that they want to see happen. I'm, I'm, an, I'm an extraordinary, enthusiastic guy. And I've been told that my enthusiasm is contagious. And I think that that, in, in no small part, is what prompted me um, to, to want to do that. Significant issues that Midland Public School is facing going forward, in my, in my opinion. I don't have the background that all you do, um, but, so I may be wrong. Um, on the bad side of things, because I do think you have some good challenges coming up. Uh, on the bad side of things, challenges that may be potentially negative right now, the demographics of the community are changing. And that's going to impact the district. And it can impact the district in a negative way, but I don't think it has to. I think you can embrace the change in demographics. The, the key will be how will you embrace the changing demographic and at the same time continue the high levels of achievement that you have become accustomed to here at Midland Public Schools. I think that can be done with, without a doubt. But I think it's going to take everybody. And I think it's going to take everybody first realizing that that change is happening. Again, I'm an educator. I'm a teacher. And I really believe that I, part of my job is teaching people about the need for change. And if Midland Public Schools is going to change to address this demographic shift, we better start educating people about the need for it. And that begins with telling them about the change in and of itself. So that's a big challenge. The second challenge that you have is financial. You know, that, that's a big step. Um, the Midland Public Schools budget has, has taken a big hit. $20J went away, and that, that was a big part of what, of what funded things here. A lot of money. Um, I think I, in looking at something that I had read online, uh, the possibility of a $2 million deficit um, facing the district next year, financial issues can really drag a district down. And they can drag it down not just financially, but in the morale of people that are working within the district too. That, that can happen if you let it. I've got a vast amount of experience in dealing with financial issues. I didn't think I was a financial expert when I became a superintendent in Gladwin. It turns out that I am somewhat of a financial expert. Um, I became very, um, I became very adept at dealing with those types of issues. But I approached it less from an analytical um, financial mastermind perspective, and I approached it as a teacher. And as it turns out, in an educational organization, that's the best way to approach it. Those are two major challenges that might be that might be negative um, for the district. And how do you keep achievement up in dealing with those? Well, at the same time, dealing with those. On the positive side, when the bond passes, those are going to be huge challenges. And uh, converting Central into a new tech school, you know, the construction that goes along with it. Um, it in Gladwin, we have, uh, I have been involved in the passing of two bond issues, two construction bond issues. One, to completely renovate um, all of the buildings with the exception of the high school in the district. And that bond was passed just before my arrival there. I actually worked as a community member on that one. And, um, but I, it started when I arrived. 
and I was very, very involved in that construction process. I, I have a background in construction. I, I, I have built many homes that I have turned around and sold when the housing market was great. I don't do it anymore. The uh, housing market is not quite quite what it once was for that reason. But I have a, I have a background in, in construction. My father was uh, owned a plumbing, heating, and electrical business. And I'd like to tell people that I grew up in everybody's crawl space in Gladys. <laughs> 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 one of the things, you know, we. We would go into these crawl spaces, and they typically don't smell very good, especially <laughs> if they're having a plumbing problem. <laughs> and I, I can remember being a young boy one time, and, and I've made this comment before, and I went into a crawl space. I said, Dad, I can't stand the smell. My dad looked at me, you know, and he was dirt from head to toe from crawling through this crawl space. And he said, you're going to learn that that smell is the smell of money. <laughs> <laughs> so I have, I have a background in that. We, we, I managed that construction bond very tightly. Um, at the end of the day, we, um, we had over $2 million of unexpended funds in, in that bond. We did everything we wanted to do plus and still had money left over. And the way we did that was really quite simple. Um, every single change order that came down, I had to see it. And I don't mean on paper. I required the construction manager to take me by the hand and walk me out to the change. What are you changing and why? And before I sign, allowing you to spend more money than what you had told me you were going to, I want to see it with my own eyes and I want to talk about why you need to do that. And I want to beat you up a little bit and maybe it won't cost so much. And as it turns out, that worked. We saved a bunch of money. We turned around and asked the community. We said to them, community, we saved this money. Let us do another bond that will allow us to take the, save, the savings that we have and spend it on the high school to fix some longstanding issues there. The community approved it overwhelmingly, and we did the renovations to the high school. So those are challenges that you're going to face on the good side when the bond passes. All those construction projects happening and managing those bond, those, those bond proceeds uh, appropriately. The, the, the new tech building, as I alluded to, and certainly when we start handing out personal computing devices to everybody, the challenges that go along with that we talked about earlier also. Well, our time is up, so it's uh, your turn. How did I do? You did, you did really No, we, we, we keep you on time. Okay, good. But you did very good. Um, you're, you're posing a question to us, and we'll try to re respond to it with a variety of different uh, views from the board. Sure. My number one question is, what does the board see as your biggest challenges, your top three, your top three biggest challenges moving forward from the board's perspective. Did you let someone speak before I do? I, I can go ahead and um, turning the next uh, um, turning the next chapter in Midland Public Schools with uh, embracing innovation. Um, how do we how do we have education look differently, more efficient, more effective? Pressures on. And the public is looking for um, outcomes um, to uh, be more competitive on a global scale. Um, looking at the um, uh, the increased percentage of our students that are um, at risk for a reduced lunch population, um, also financial ongoing. I don't I don't think that those will go away. Uh, they'll be present with us for some time. So I think the innovation piece in light of the other two. I, I, I wrap it up in a little a little bigger ball. Everything John said, I 100% agree with. There's no, no difference of opinion there. Um, but I also see it in a scheme of continuing, ever-growing expectations of results with the demographic shifts you've talked mm -hmm. about, the financial pressures are there. And on top of that, then, what you already mentioned, the implementation of our successful millages. Um, of our taxpayers, I'm assuming they will give us that uh, trust we have to show that trust back that we spend it wisely and well. Absolutely. And we've had a great history on the sinking fund of projects be delivered on budget, on time. And I, I know uh, they, the new board members here haven't gone through all that so much, but as we were going through those, that with a nine months construction schedule, you'll be well aware that that's a difficult challenge. Right. That's a push. And it was always nice never to see Midland Daily, Midland uh, Public Schools highlighted in the newspapers for delaying school because of projects, right. yet reading a whole bunch of other districts delaying school because of projects. So I see managing that implementation, which is very tactical, is differentiated from the strategic of how we're going to achieve these ever-increasing goals uh, with the shift in def demographics and dollars. Mm -hmm. Any others? I see our main challenge is making sure all our students are either 100% college ready or career ready. So. Absolutely, in this economy, it's a big disservice if kids aren't ready for one of those two things. Absolutely. The at the end of the first year with your with your new superintendent, what tell me what a successful superintendent will have looked like in in that year's time. 
I would, I would, um, I guess first and foremost that comes to my mind, Rick, is, is something that you alluded to, is developing those relationships. Because I really feel like if that strong relationship isn't there and that communication, the other pro the projects, the curriculum, all those other pieces are going to be more difficult to put together. So I would like to see that, those relationships grown and um, us steaming ahead and, and getting projects and looking at curriculum and changes and innovation all being, all being worked on as a team and together. Good. Yeah, I, I would agree. <coughs> agree with her definitely developing the trust factor and it seems like hopefully with the passing of this today there will be a lot of new programs that we're going to have to make sure that we really have a good vision of where we're going forward so that all these changes that we're looking at right now come to fruition. I, I think to sum it up with just re, uh, re-energizing the entire district around a vision. I think we have good talent, we have a great vision. Um, going into 21st century learning with all the potential, the, the follow through on that. And the other thing that I mentioned last night to one of our other candidates is the um, looking at some of the innovative ways to work with our, our uh, at-risk kids. Uh, Judge uh, Allen, Doreen Allen, has really worked on some uh, very promising uh, pilot programs in the community working with East Lawn. Uh, it would be nice to look at the innovation and in making those um, creative, a good fit for Midland, but also to um, engage the community. And I think that's a, r a really important piece is how our superintendents have been really engaged and entrenched in the community. And, and uh, Midland has always had the motto of taking care of its own. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and Rick, I would add, um, one of the things we learned, I guess that we all knew, and I would have described it this way, but it was great that the search firm brought it out from the focus groups. They were impressed with how interwoven is the word I would use, the Midland community is. You've been here, you get that. Absolutely. Um, and so I would expect a new superintendent to come in and jump into the center of that uh, tangled web mm -hmm. and get to understand all the facets that Lynn talked about to direct us to the direction that John and Angela talked about. Uh, so integrating well into the community, uh, not just the schools, but the entire community will be critical. I think you're absolutely right. That will be critical. From my perspective, um, I, I, I want to be um, very upfront with the board that I, you, you asked me the question earlier about um, being a good fit or why I thought I would be a good fit from Midland. I'm not, I'm not looking for a job. I, I, that's not where I'm at in my career. I'm looking for this job. And that, that there's an important difference. Um, I have been very successful with the help of many people in Gladwin. And the things that we've achieved there have exceeded even my own personal expectation. And I'm very proud of them. I told you I get goosebumps when I talk about it. But I believe after, after studying and looking at, at what Midland Public Schools is looking for, where they're at and where they're headed, I believe that I have the skills and the experience to help you turn that new chapter here at Midland Public Schools. And, and this, is, this is not a man that's looking for um, his next superintendent's job. I'm looking for a superintendent's job here. Well, Rick, I think that's a great place to wrap it up. <laughs> uh, I, I won't ruin the moment and right. uh, leave it sit with that. And, and with that, thank you for coming down. Appreciate it a bunch. Um, we will be hearing back from us in all likelihood. It's a public meeting on Wednesday, so you'll probably know if you, uh, if you get there tuned in somehow. Uh, but for sure, by Thursday morning, you'll be hearing from us or the search firm. Good. I look so forward to it. Appreciate coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thanks. I enjoyed it. It's good to see you. It's good, good to see you as well. Nice to meet you. Thanks Thank for you. coming. Thanks for coming, Rick. It's oh, it was great pleasure. to hear from you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Yeah. It's a pleasure Thank meeting you. you. Thanks. All right. Okay. We will take a um, six minute break. I call it six, uh, well, actually five. So we're back here a minute before the started time so we can get the interview started at 8 30. So good. Thank you. Alrighty. Welcome to Midland. Thanks for coming up. Yep. John Kaminsky. Oh, John, nice to meet you. Yeah. Hi, Angela Graham. Nice to meet you. Hi, Scott Parr. Uh, nice to meet you. Hi, Yvonne Gordon. Nice to meet you. I'm Lynn Baker Heichel. Nice, nice to meet you. you. I'm Dan Bickell. Nice to meet you. Or did I ever turn it on? Did you ever turn it on? I stayed live. Okay. No, I, I never turned it on. Did I? You must have.
Okay, for the audience, we are going to go back and resume activity. I guess we're not back in session, we're just resuming activity. I'd like to welcome Mr. Michael Sharrow to Midland. Thank, Thank you. you very much for having me. Thank you for coming all the way up from Algonac. Um, the way the process will work is we have pre-prepared questions that each of us will ask you. Uh, there's likely to be a lot of follow-up to go into more detail and examples of each of those questions. Uh, every candidate's being asked the same one. Uh, we'll take copious notes throughout, so don't take this as ignoring. Take that as a good sign. Um, uh, at the end, we'll probably have questions for about one hour, and then uh, we'll give you 10 minutes to ask us questions, and we'll go from there. Okay. So with that said, um, first of all, welcome. And I'll lead with the, uh, the first question. Why don't you just begin by uh, briefly telling you about yourself in your career path and uh, give some concrete examples of your most notable accomplishments you're most proud of. Okay. Um, first, I guess I'd like to say that I grew up in a small business family because I think that's part of who I am today. It's pretty vital who I am as well. Um, I was a Central Michigan grad under my bachelor's degree and I was one of those middle 80s grads that had to go elsewhere for work and so I uh, interviewed and was hired in Houston ISD. And so I went from a very um, uh, plain community in Algonac, very plain community in Mount Pleasant, to fourth largest city in the United States with a lot of diversity. And that was a great training ground, a great place to start. Um, in the 80s, um, Houston ISD wasn't a real good place to be. Today it's much better than it was. And so there were some great learning examples going on there. And I had some opportunities real early on um, I became a head coach down there very early, and those provided a lot of leadership skills. Um, I went from Houston after six years, and I arrived in the Woodlands, Texas. And if you know anything about the Woodlands, it's <laughs> probably a lot like your community, maybe a little more wealthier, more but yeah. very uh, similar in the sense that um, it's Shell's world headquarters, and you have execs who come to the community and move into the community. Um, those high education levels who are, have high ex expectations and so I found that a really great experience. Um, spent three years there as their head coach. Had the opportunity to win a state championship in both football and baseball there. Was not the head coach in football, but um, in baseball I was. Um, and so some really good learning experiences in a community that size. High school, 4,000 students when I was there. So much different than we see in Michigan. Um, after nine years in Texas, uh, our, we decided that home would be really nice to go back to. And so um, I applied for a position and arrived back in the other end of the world, and I arrived in a high school of 400 students in Marcellus, Michigan, on the west side. Um, after a year's opportunity there, I got a phone call from the assistant superintendent in Algonac, which is my hometown. And so he was my middle school principal and had followed my career and asked me if I'd be interested in coming back to Algonac with the idea that they would eventually train me to be an assistant principal. So I arrived back in Algonac as a coach, teacher, and um, in two years became an assistant principal. After four years became the principal. Was groomed from day one to replace Dr. Dennis Geis as a su successful superintendent in Algonac and then became superintendent there and here I am today. I didn't really fill in the highlights, sorry about no, that. That's good. Uh, any uh, major accomplishments you want to talk about at Algonac? Yes, um, certainly. Um, as superintendent, uh, we've we're a small district, but you know, looking at your district and looking at, our, at ours, there's a lot of parallels in some things that we've done. In fact, you were one of the districts we came and looked at your IB program um, four or five years ago at, at this time. And so when we began to explore IB, we weren't sure we could do it with a 600 student high school. Um, and so I think that's a feather in our cap that we were able to figure a way to do IB um, and bring a, a rigorous program, global perspective to our students. Um, in Algonac, uh, I've noticed today is a big day for you, not just in these interviews, but some of the other things you have going on uh, and in the move towards one-to-one -to -one mobile technology. We have done that in Algonac. Um, our high schools presently, and that over the next two years, will be a K-12 one-to-one district. So I'm very proud of that opportunity as well. Um, I've always heard because, again, uh, we came up and studied some things you did with early childhood education. And, um, and I'm a big believer in early childhood education, and we've expanded our program. It's, uh, during my tenure, it's grown, um, doubled its size. Um, while the last piece I'd like to add is while high school principal, um, I was, we had the 
highest t NEEP test scores in both Macomb and St. Clair counties. And so we, we, we performed quite well as well. Well, excellent. And we'll teach you those more depth through the other questions, I am sure. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Lynn. All right. Michael, please describe your leadership and communication style, how you make decisions, resolve conflicts, work with your executive team, administrators, staff, board of ed, and move the organization forward. Give us an example of a complex problem you faced and the process you used to resolve it. If I miss something here, you're going to hit. <laughs> or, or I'll repeat, yep. Um, I, I would think uh, leadership style, you know, you, there's a lot of textbook definitions out there. And I, and I think um, not one leadership style fits um, me nor what you should do. Um, I kind of like to think mine is situational depending on the situation we're in. I can be very direct if we need be, but I also like to be collaborative. Um, and so there's different styles of leadership. Talking about our administrative team, administrative teams, uh, I've kind of been known to use the saying that um, I always tell my administrators, my teachers, I'm just part of the team, but at this point, I've been kind of chosen captain to lead. And so uh, to me, you know, I, they're, they're just as important as I, and I need their opinions in order to be successful. Um, so we're very collaborative. Um, Obviously, you're quite a bit larger than Elgin Acton, so that would be a little different um, uh, skill here than in Elgin Act where I have uh, 10 administrators. Um, but that's a key to us as well. Communication with the, with the community, I believe, was part of the question. Um, you know, through my, through my six years in Elgin Act, which was my hometown, I communicate in multiple ways in writing. So we send... Um, Five times a year, we send what we call the Elgin Act School Reporter to every household in the community. Um, we think that's real vital. When we pull our community, they say it's the number one source of information they have on schools, more so than the local newspapers. Um, but then we felt like we needed more, and so we began to communicate electronically. Years ago, we did what most school districts today, where you send emails regularly from your buildings or at the central office. And then I began to do a soups memo every Monday to my community and my staff. And all that's important and vital, but the number one thing I realized is that many of our community members don't get information by writing, from, from reading and uh, writing. And so we have to learn to communicate that informal way of communication. And today, the whole electronic world is a big piece of that informal uh, piece of communication. So. We've entered the world of Twitter and Facebook as well. Um, but I also think, you know, getting into your community, getting into your community service groups, foundations, talking to as many people as you can because you've got to get on the ground level in order for that communication to stick. There's many more parts of your questions. You're going to have to catch me on the pieces that I missed. Um, communication with the Board of Education. Um, the formal way I communicate with the board is I do a Friday letter every week. And so the board receives that on Friday afternoon. And it followed up by what we call Monday phone calls. And so um, many times the Monday phone calls are a repeat of what, what the Friday letter was, but it gives us that face-to-face, -face, that opportunity mm -hmm. to uh, communicate. Um, so it's quite a bit of work, but it's well worth it. There's, it's really hard for board members sometimes to say, well, I really didn't know that, but I, I'm able to say, well, you, you did have it in a Friday letter, and here, here's, here's where you had that. And so I think it's pretty key for us. Um, I'm also known to go, go to lunch with my board members, stop at their homes. Um, we're small enough that we do that and now gonna act. And so I think that that piece is, is just as vital, uh, vital to communicate with your board. Um, let's see. And do you have an example of a complex problem you faced in the process you used to resolve it? Yes. Sure, plenty of them. <laughs> <laughs> it, of course, today we're thinking of mostly finances, correct? I guess I will go there um, uh, with finances. You know, um, I started five years ago in our community, and I began to go out and present to our community that we were declining in enrollment, and the change in the auto industry was eventually going to affect us as well in our funding. Um, and so I was one of the earlier districts get out there and speak about that and the need to reduce. And so we, I think we got real reactive instead of, or proactive instead of reactive, and we're able to do some innovative uh, items along the way. One of the things we've done in all our buildings is instead of assistant principals, 
um, we were able to create something called the discipline officer. And it basically is somebody who does the same role as assistant principal on the discipline side of it. They're not an academic person. And so we were able to take these people um, and pay them a lower wage with less benefits than you would traditionally see an assistant principal and save significant dollars. Um, and it works just as well as we've had previously. It solved the budget issue problem. And so uh, that, that's gone over real well um, and, and worked well. And, and I think it solved a financial issue we had in our buildings. Great. Thank you. Any follow-ups? I'll move on to Devon. Describe your 90-day plan for entering the district. Please give specific examples of what you would do. First thing in walking into the district, you, you would have to meet with each and every person um, in the leadership positions in the district. So your center office staff, your building, each board member, um, com important community members to get to know the community, to, to know what's occurring. Um, I think one of the wise, uh, especially particularly a successful district like, you, like yours, when you first enter, um, I don't think you change too many things at all. I mean, you do that as time goes once you learn the lay of the land and figure out those type of items. Um, from there, you know, I, I think a strategic plan and goal setting plan with the board is vital. Um, you, you've got a new era, a new start. Um, those items would need to be, be laid out for us and, and to go forward. You know, today for you, um, your future may be changed in multiple ways with the, with the bond and the uh, sinking fund that you're looking at. And so, you know, you're really sitting at a perfect time to set a new strategic plan going forward. I think today, um, studying in a district is so much easier than we used to have. So already, I know more about you and you know more about me than we used to be able to with the transparency and all the information we have out there. So traditionally, what 90-day plans were have changed over time because it's real obvious to, for us to look at your data, financial data, your student achievement data, and already know what that is. And um, you, you do a very good job on your website, and so there was, there was really easy to look into um, what the community is saying, what your goals were, what you're looking for. You know, you're really looking for, you know, to take a good district and move it into to a great district, and so I think those are um, all part of that strategic plan and what we would look at, try to look at right away. Follow-ups? No? We'll move to John. Describe the optimal relationship between the board and the superintendent. Discuss a time when you needed to advise a board that may have overstepped their policy making boundaries and infringed upon your role as an administrator. Specifically, how did you manage this? Well, you know, the textbook definition is you're, you're the policy setters and um, I'm, I'm your one employee in the district and sometimes we need to uh, be right, reminded each other of that. Um, and so superintendents sometimes overstep their boundaries as well and get into policy. Um, and, and then I think for me at times I've had to remind the board in a small community that I am their one employee of the district and that's always gone quite well for me. I have a great relationship with my board and I have a very good board um, and so for me it's just simply a quick discussion you know that's kind of my role and generally we see real quick that that's where we need to go. Um, we haven't had many times where we stepped on each other's toes in Elginac so it's not really an issue for us. I think open discussion about those things is, is, is the vital way to correct them if it's occurring, going on. Certainly not in public. Mm -hmm. um, that's occurred, occurred in our state recently, if, if you've read some of the recent newspapers. And, and I think um, in Lance Cruz a few weeks ago, that was mishandled by both the board and the superintendent. And so many, many of those discussions should occur not in public at that time. Okay, thank you. Any follow-ups? No. We'll move to Kim. Describe your experience with collective bargaining negotiations and what strategies can be used to promote collaborative relationships when bargaining difficult issues. Again, I would assume uh, bargaining in Elginac is a little bit different than in Midland. I sit at the table and I lead the discussion most of the time. We, we do, um, at times, use legal counsel to lead the discussion. We use legal counsel all the way through. Um, we are very collaborative in bargaining, and we've had 
um, wonderful relationships with our employee groups despite these difficult times where they've had to give many, many concessions. And for us, it's uh, being very transparent and open. So we usually start off, we're in that period right now, we are into a teacher bargaining. Um, tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock, we'll be meeting with the leaders of the MEA um, and their Uniserve director to review our financials. Um, they have questions how we could be um, moving from 23% fund equity to 16% fund equity and asking for concessions. So that's a difficult spot, spot to start the conversation because we're still in a pretty good financial situation and they don't understand the spend down of money is the issue, not the amount of money we have to save. Um, so that open, transparent starts co those conversations off wonderfully. Difficult bargaining um, also requires patience. And so normally, many of us get impatient. We would like to get that agreement right away and have it done. And at times, it just, there needs to be some time for everyone to gather their information, gather their thoughts, move through it. Um, we're also working with our bus drivers at this point. Um, two years ago, we had took a look at privatization. And there we are. Uh, moving to privatize our transportation services, but we are protecting our employees and giving them the option to stay our employee or theirs. Um, this has taken about a two-year period to kind of slowly move them through that process to get to this point. And uh, by the end of the month, I think we'll be done with it. And we've had no debate in our community, no real issues over moving such a controversial issue as such as privatization. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, I had benchmarked with Bloomfield um, Hill Schools and their negotiations with their teachers is they didn't uh, want their teachers to take a pay cut because they really value their teachers highly and the administration took a pay cut. Have you taken a pay cut or has your salary stayed flat over the last few years? My board has not ever asked me personally for um, concessions. I have volunteered concessions, so at this point in time, um, I, I give five days of pay back to the district each year out of my wages. And so that's something I personally have done. Um, as far as uh, the teachers um, giving up wages, um, our, our teachers have given major concessions and they will, they will again this year, but we have worked very hard to try to not to take money out of their present check they receive. And so many of our negotiations, and part of it is because we've been able to, um, ha we do have large fund equity, and we're not in the panic situation some districts are, we've been able to um, gain savings by not getting their what they expect in the future, steps, lane changes, those types of things going forward. Um, obviously, we've all received the benefit um, of the caps or the 80-20 on the insurance, so that helps as well. So that's approach we've taken with our teachers a as well. Teachers have been hit pretty hard by our state, you know, and so we need concessions, but you still need to have uh, professional teachers who are paid reasonably well. Oh, follow up. Um, you mentioned earlier about the spend down from 25% to 16%. That sounds pretty big, rapid rate. Uh, you talked about trying to get uh, folks to understand it's the where it's going to, not what it is. Uh, what have you done to try to do that? And uh, what are your concerns uh, when you said sometimes negotiations take longer, that you'll be fast enough to, to avoid the, the train wreck? We strategically um, went into last year knowing we, it was probably time to spend down. With 23% fund equity, we were probably in the top 10% in, in, in the state public school wise. There's some academies that obviously have money built for capital purchases. Um, so there, it was time to use some of our rainy day fund. Um, as far as educating our community on that, every year I do a state of, of our schools address, and I do that in multiple locations. So I go out and I do it with every, t every building in the district. I go out and I do it to the Rotary Club and the Lions Club and the Historical Club and the senior citizens, and, and I make sure everyone's kept up to date on the state of the district and, of course, the finances have been a huge part of that at this point in time. Um, but also I would have to say my columnist and my reporter, my soups, weekly soups memo often carry that same message. And so I don't believe our community has been 
has ever felt that they were left out of that loop. You know, there, there, would, there would be those who would argue that 16% um, is too, too large and we can continue to spend down. Um, actually, our board strategy is that we may spend some still down. We just hope it's much slower because, as, as you can see, that, that percentage is just too much to do again because in a short period of time we would be out of funds. And so um, last year we all were also hit with some legislative changes that cost us some of that money, the all-day kindergarten for us. Um, we were all-day kindergarten, but we were the model of um, – rotating between parapro and teacher and so we had to add additional staffing um, and for a district our size five new K teachers is a big chunk of the budget at that point in time okay any others move to Angela <coughs> tell us about one area in your district budget that you have had to trim or modify due to budget constraints and how is the decision reached and who was involved in the decision-making process well, they've all been obviously reduced at this point in time. Um, well, let's talk about transportation and how we reached that conclusion um, to re obviously reduce there. Um, started with our community. So we began to, you know, show figures, data. This is our fund equity. This is what we're spending. This is what our enrollment trend is. This is what's occurring in Lansing. What's the most likely scenario for budgets going forward? Uh, we, we would go to our employee groups, including transportation, share that piece with them. Um, we also, when, when any time we're into a budget reduction, we try to hold a forum, like many districts do, where we would have we would refer, have representatives from every employee bargaining group there, as well as community members, board members, and kind of a brainstorming um, session, throw ideas on the board, put costs to it, take a look at it, and obviously that all comes back to the board to make those decisions or not. Um, so moving through that process with transportation, uh, we've been able to get to the point where I think this is going to be done with a relatively little pain and, and reduce that budget for us nearly a million dollars is what we're going to be able to reduce because of employee costs as well as future bus purchases. Follow up? Is that nine million per year? A million dollars. A million. Thank you. I'm sorry. I misheard the number. I was, I was, whoa. <laughs> um, what would you tell me if I called your union leaders right now how that process has worked? What would they tell me? I'm pretty positive they would tell you that it's been very collaborative. Um, they would say that um, I'm very open and I'm very genuine and honest with them. They don't always like what I have to say. And that has been truly the message for all of us in this business right now that we're not delivering real good messages um, to our community or um, employees yesterday I delivered six layoff notices to teachers you know I personally did that um, I know later on they'll appreciate that I'm not sure it mattered yesterday to them when they received it that I delivered it but um, so I think being genuine open honest with that um, has really helped um, all my union friends presidents what most of them do, aren't happy that I'm interviewing tonight, so. Okay. Interesting comment. Thank you. Um, I think we're moving to Scott. Oh, oh, go can ahead, I ask my question? Um, have you worked with a green energy expert? Not, not with a green energy expert. Uh, we worked with Honeywell, who is <coughs> our um, controller uh, for our HVAC systems. Um, and we entered into an energy bond, I'm going to say seven or eight years ago at that point in time. Um, I noticed that you also, and I'm going to forget the name, out of Texas, the company that works more on the consumption side, the personal pattern side. We, we did as well, uh, and I found it ironic that the issue that you had sounded like probably results from our district because we did at one point back out of the, the contract and the software purchase on that. Um, but we've done lots of energy consumption things to be to do that. When you talk about green energy, um, through our bond program, our largest two buildings, our middle school and high school, are geothermal, and that was part of something our community wanted. And so we've gone to the geothermal, and it's worked relatively well. It's a, a little more finicky system, and so we know that we've spent some money on the controlling side, um, repair side of the piece that we we were counting on saving on the energy side of it as well. 
Any others? I'll move this down. All right. Given the economic climate, how do you set fiscal priorities regarding the resources needed to educate children? I think you said the key world, ch children, right? And so um, for us, obviously, you have a mission and a vision, and you set your goals, and we've had strategic planning. Um, everything should tie back to your strategic, strategic plan, which should evolve strictly about student achievement. What is good for children, and does this help student achievement? So uh, in these trying times when we're all reducing and being asked to have higher student achievement, you know, how are we going to do that? And um, we can get frustrated. But personally, I find it um, a little bit scary, but a whole lot exciting. Because to me, in, in the next 10, 12 years of my career, uh, you know, I think education is going to change faster than it ever has in my 52 years here. Um, so I believe we all have to get creative in our delivery of instruction which will create efficiency, but certainly quality. And the whole technology-enriched environment is going to change that. Um, it's one of our big interests in the one-to-one, -one, um, so we can begin to go further with blended learning. Uh, the, the traditional brick-and-mortar high school, five day, days a week, it's probably not going to exist in the future in that manner. Um, and I'm one that the believes probably it should not exist in the manner we've been doing it. Education is going to become much more personalized, much more flexible than we ever have. And we're going to find those efficiencies in order to keep the quality. And so you know, I think that all fits the strategic plan and coming back to setting what's proper for kids. And you need that strategic plan in order to, to set your, um, your resources for it. Follow-ups? Um, I do. I have quite a few on that one. Um, you obviously think the world will change, and many of us do also. Um, what have you done at Algonac to pave that way for that change? And what have you found that's worked effectively, and uh, what would you change? Well, the, our bond issue was, for us, $36 million is significant, um, and we spent a, a good portion of that on the technology infrastructure. And so for us, we were Wi-Fi five years ago in all of our buildings. Um, the server rooms, the backbone, and I'm talking out of my field here when you get into all those pieces of that. But we set a lot of, uh, of those things in place with the idea that um, five years ago that the world was going to move very quickly. And, um, and, and let me go off track just a little bit there. Um, recently, over the last year, we worked um, with a gentleman named Scott Setzer. He was the one that created um, the virtual school in North Carolina. And he's, he's since left that. Um, and he's, he's kind of a guru in that field. And, and our topic was really, what does the future of learning look like? And so none of us can truly define that. We're all talking about it and saying it's going to be technology enriched, the traditional brick and mortar building's not going to exist. Um, but, but, so we've had lots of discussion, discussion, lots of research trying to find what that's going to look like for us. And we still haven't defined it, but I can say that we came down to the whole idea of personalization is going to be a big thing for us, particularly here in Michigan. You have the cyber charters now able to move into your area. Students are going to be able to learn anytime, any place, anywhere. We hear that from our governor, our state superintendent. Uh, we need to get serious about that in our, in our building. So um, I think that was a big change for us as we began to use our technology. It used to be smart boards in, in the classroom and how we enhanced what happened in the classroom. We now... We offer blended learning courses, online learning courses. We have kids that are coming in three days a week, two days meeting online, um, the whole collaborative environments that are out there. And so um, I think that's really the change we're all looking for. And we did that with our technology. We're in pretty good shape still, although we're beginning to push the whole bandwidth Wi-Fi capability. We've had to upgrade our Wi-Fi just going into the next year because of all the one-to-one. -one. Can you give some examples of uh, online courses you're offering? and? and how that's done and the mechanisms that's done? Yes. Um, we have five presently in our high school that are the blended learning where they um, meet face-to-face -face three or four days a week, and then the other times collaboratively outside the classroom. All of them use different platforms, so some are Moodle, you know, some are Edmodo, those type of systems. So we've left that up to each individual teacher. We've given training both at our RESA as well as locally for our teachers to, do, to have that. Um, in our middle school and elementary, obviously, we're not 
in the blended form where students aren't coming to school, at least not as, as of today, but certainly blended where they're, it's kind of flipped, the whole idea of flipping the classroom where they're doing much of the, the work outside, coming in and getting the collaboration, the, the facilitator part of what the teacher needs to do as well outside. And so um, that's kind of what our blended looks like at this point in time with the idea that recently that's why we worked with Mr. Setzer was in order to this what's the next level, where are we going next. Are you importing online courses from other places or are you ex uh, and or are you exporting online courses? We, uh, as a county, we've decided to create an online catalog where we could import or export and presently we export some. But or excuse me, export, but do not import any at this time. We have used Michigan Virtual in the past for foreign languages that we weren't able to offer, particularly Mandarin. Excellent. I have a, I have a question cool. to follow up. So with some of these programs that you have, has have you found that that has brought some school of choice children into your district? Yes. Um, we receive more school of choice than we leave. Um, we also have a gentleman's kind of agreement in our county that we, we're not, we don't openly recruit each other, even though we sit on the border of Macomb County, which does that very aggressively. <laughs> so um, uh, we, we draw more from Macomb than we lose, and I won't name the district that we border. Um, and there's a, multiple reasons. Some choose us for the smaller family setting versus the large. Some choose us for IB. That was definitely something that drove our, our enrollment up. And we are considered in our county probably the most creative district in the county, and so people have recognized that, and we do have school choice because of that. Excellent. Any others? Um, I think I'm on to Lynn, if I'm not mistaken. Sorry. Oh, to me. No. I'm sorry. No, you. Uh, I think you're, you're right in the wheelhouse where we were just headed. Uh, can you give us a practical example of what 21st century learning that incorporates technology looks like? We've kind of covered that, but anything else that we haven't touched on that, that that you would see going into a new district, think would need to be done, or in your existing district, what the future looks like? You know, I, I, I read something, and I may be reading into it wrong about something you're doing. I'm going to forget the name of it, but it was kind of like a resource area that you're potentially would be building in one, in your high schools, I believe, or your middle schools. Um, I think that may be where we're going, all looking in the future is, um, so as for us in our side of school, it's we have a very dynamic media center um, director, and that that is becoming our online collaborative learning world. And so kids drop in, move in and out of there to get the resources they need. Um, the other one we know is is we've polled our community. The number of people who have internet in their homes is high, but not all. Um, certainly, Wi-Fi is a little lower. And so our building centers are going to remain open with those areas because of the Wi-Fi capability. So um, an elementary school that sits in the center of town will now be o have open hours from 6 to 8 in the evening, but it won't be just elementary students be arriving. There will be any student in the neighborhood to use the Wi-Fi connection to, to do the work we're having. And so the one-to-one -one mobile is wonderful, but we still have some people that aren't um, quite there, and how do we do that? We also see that um, we believe when we adopted the one-to-one -one mobile, we put a sustainable plan in for six years out um, in order to do that. We're very creative in these financial times to do that. But I, we believe that in a short period of time, it'll be one-to-one, -one, um, bring your own device. We're providing to those who can't. I mean, um, if you're reading the articles already, most parents support that, who can, that the students have the smartphone, the iPad, the Chromebook, whatever it is. and those devices are beginning to come in. And so um, we started off, we're purchasing them all, and, we, and the iPad is a device, but that's going to change, I think, in a short period of time. Hopefully that answers some of your questions. Mm -hmm. Any follow-ups, John? Yeah, with the, uh, w as far as the skills that the technology is developing, what 21st century learning skills do you see your students developing and what you have you accomplished in uh, your district? Well, if we're still talking mostly about technology, I think um, obviously, you know, the whole uh, global citizenship to the Wi-Fi is going to be a big piece. Mm -hmm. But I, when we talk about 21st century learning skills, I find it ironic that in um, foreign countries come to study us, and the piece they want to study out of us is our ability that we've taught students to critically think, problem solve, do those issues. And 
as we all know, we get pushed harder and harder for standardized um, testing, and which we do need some of that. Don't get me wrong, but I'm afraid that if we're not careful, we're going to lose some of those other pieces. So I, so I really believe when we look towards 21st century learning uh, or 21st century careers, I keep and the governor just talked about the number of careers that were out there that we didn't have students prepared for that they're already there, and there was a disconnect between the two. Um, I struggle with the whole idea that I'm educating students for a present career in place when we all know that many of those careers don't even exist they're going to go into. And then you hear stats that, you know, unlike many of us, they'll change jobs six, seven times over their lifetime. Um, I look at just education and how it's changed in my time period. And so I think, I don't know, I kind of disagree with teaching, I believe in technical and career education, but I also believe that we need to teach students to con constantly learn, problem solve, critically think. Those are going to be the skills going forward. You sit here with, with Dow Corporation in the world. Boy, what could they be doing in 15, 20 years, and what kind of worker are they looking for? Well, they're looking for someone who can be retrained, re retaught, self-taught. Um, problem solve is always going to be there. Those, I think, are the skills that are going to last no matter where we're going going okay. forward. The globalization is here, and you know, obviously, you guys may have looked at that with IB as one of your reasons, and with Dow, people moving in and out of the community and where they come from, and so that's another piece. Maybe the, you know, we all talk about learning a foreign language. I don't know if it's so much learning the language; it is learning about cultures and, and understanding the global world that those students are going to live in. I moved from Texas to Michigan, and that was huge in the '80s. <laughs> Today, they're, they're going to be moving countries like I moved states. So. <laughs> I, I lived in Texas for a number of years, very familiar with the Woodlands, and that was a culture change. Yes. <laughs> okay, uh, move to Lynn. Yes, share any experience you may have had in establishing equity for children with differing needs, implementing the RTI model, and developing and evaluating gifted and talented programs. We'll start the other spectrum. So um, I think you're touching on special education. And what have we done there? We obviously use RTI. Um, and I'm going to even go back to early childhood education. I think the key there, um, one of the reasons it's so strong, we're a very diverse community economically. So of yourself, probably um, maybe not as many at the high, but you know, we have a waterfront where we have million dollar homes and we have a part of town that's um, a very poor. And so we need to get those children into our schools as soon as possible to teach the skills that they're missing to prevent. And so intervention is the key to um, preventing the need for special education services. And then we've been successful in lowering it, and we had a significant number of special education students. So since I've been superintendent, we've reduced um, single digits still, but high single digits probably, um, the percentage of our special education students and it, it is the early interventions that we put in place. Um, progress monitoring students as they enter school as well. So we've really got into a data warehouse. We use Data Director. Um, we, we use all the same testing tools that you Dibbles and NWA and STAR assessments. And we use that data and we follow <coughs> it closely so we can put our interventions in, in quickly or bring them out quickly and, and supply them to other students in order to prevent in the special education. Um, talking about gifted and talent, it's something that I wish we had done more. And so we have IB at the high school. Um, when I became a high school principal, we had two AP courses. We went to eight, eight AP courses. Um, when I was transitioning from high school principal to a superintendent, that's when we were exploring the whole ID, IB piece. Um, I give credit to my present day high school principal because I handed it off and said, go find out if we can do this or not. So he's really the guru of IB. Um, but I think that's a gifted and talent program in itself. Um, we do not do enough at the elementary levels. You know, we used to um, do more when there was a countywide grant. We had funding from Odyssey of the Mines to um, pulling kids out for enrichment. So it's much smaller scale. Um, we do do some unique things at our middle school still. Um, we do it countywide. We'll pull our most gifted kids, have them ride our tech and career bus to the RISA, and we have a specialized teacher that will teach the top of, of those students in special programs in ELA, one semester, math and science in another. Um, because we are much smaller, you know, the number of kids that works. So we do do some, but not, not nearly as enough, enough. Any follow-ups? I think 
KIPP was born in Houston. I don't know, are you in yes. knowledgeable about the KIPP program? I sure am. That was a big part of our study with Brian Setzer, something that we had looked oh, okay. at multiple times. And were there any initiatives that came out of it that you used in your school? Uh, my elementary principals have pulled bits and pieces out of the whole KIPP idea, and so they'll quote it, they'll talk about it, they use pieces, but certainly KIPP was a vastly different environment than um, 2,000 student organized schools or 800 elementary students like we have. So we, we've adapted pieces of it. And that was the part of the whole sets of work is he has um, what he calls, a, I'm going to use the wrong terminology, bank of learning schools. And KIPP is one, and he quotes these certain schools, and he has data on them and the services they use, and we were able to um, explore all of those different environments they use. Any others? Let's see, I think we're moving to Yvonne. Describe your knowledge and any specific experience you've had in implementing and evaluating IB programs. Well, obviously, implementation at the time we implemented, I was superintendent, so I was involved in a small, small district. Part of it was uh, financing it and how were we going to do that at that time during troubling times. And we were very creative. We um, at least a cell company, a tower on our, our property, and we earmark those those funds that go into for the teacher training, the curriculum, and obviously the um, assessments portion of, of the IB. Um, worked hand in hand with former high school principal, worked hand in hand with my principal, but by far he's the expert more than I. Um, implementation and assessing it? Evaluation. Evaluating of it. Um, we collect a lot of data on our IB students. For example, um, not just how many actually complete the IB diploma program or how many go on to college. We have all that data. But we, we subgroup through Data Warehouse, most of those, and we, and we know that our IB students gain um, on the ACT, for example, 3.5, and I'm just using a number, somewhere in there, uh, percentage points um, where that's larger gain than other students. And if you think, about them already being potentially near their, um, their their height in the ACT score and with that large of a gain that's significant. So we track data to make sure we provide that to the board to make sure the board I I is seeing what they invested in and make sure it's something that they um, feel is worthy of what we're doing. So that's kind of what we've done on the assessment part of it. What, uh, what, ha what hasn't gone well? What, what have you had to intervene and change from your original approaches? From IB? Yep. Okay. Um, we, because with the size of us, um, during these hard times, sometimes we have classes, IB classes with low numbers, 15, 16, 13, um, and you begin to say, can we do this? And can we continue to do those things? And so that hasn't been the easiest one to do. So with the... Uh, exporting of courses, we're presently trying to work with IB and to see if they're okay with the idea that we could potentially send IB courses to another school in our county, gain students in there, um, obviously gain enrollment dollars as well for doing that. Um, we have an agreement, we pay each other so much in our county for those type of pieces. Of so that, that's probably been the most difficult piece. Um, we've been, so a high school, 700 kids, we, we, Last year was our first graduating class of IB. We had nine IB diploma students. Mm -hmm. And so and I think this year we have seven to eight. And so I don't know what your number is, but when you look at the percentages, that's a pretty significant number to actually complete the IB diploma program. We, um, in fact, the stat I can pull off the top of my head because we, we just, I just asked for it and provided it to the community. 42% of our students participate in IB in some capacity. And so pretty significant for, uh, for a young program in a school our, our size, <coughs> capacity we have of kids being involved in IB. But I think the challenge has been to make sure the courses, you know, we can afford the courses, keep the numbers high enough. Um, my, my principal uses a scheduling system where he um, pre-loads them into the courses that they belong by data. And then of course, then the parent or the student could come and say, I really don't want IB level two, and I want to take this course. Of course, he's probably going to work real hard on keeping them in the IB and stretching them and pushing them, and that helps our numbers as well. So th that's been the difficult part for us. Okay. Any others? Uh, John. 
What experiences have you had in helping school districts or your school district uh, develop or modify program priorities? Can you go a little deeper what you're at looking for that? Um, looking at uh, because of a uh, of, uh, budget or um, or changes to a program, um, what could you say about your experiences in modifying a, a program or developing a program that could be IB, for example? Or Let me describe this one and see if it fits for you. Um, so like most school districts five, six years ago, we all got into online learning, but it was generally for credit recovery. And you had a provider who provided a computerized course that didn't have the person side of that piece of it. Um, ours grew significantly. Um, and was fairly successful with it. Then we began to um, use blended courses, online courses for some elective courses that we weren't able to offer. Um, and I had the need to reduce counseling. So generally your counselors kind of work in that area, the whole credit recovery, getting students who are behind in credits signed up as quick as possible for credit recovery because we all know if you don't catch them early on, they fall so far behind, they generally graduate from an alternative program, not you. Um, but I need to cut counseling. And so, again, we got innovative because of budget and created what we call a graduation coach, online coordinator, a non-educator by trade. We could be able to pay significantly cheaper. And she is directly responsible, and she's paid by performance so that she has a re uh, performance um, goal of having 9% of all students who lose credit signed up the immediate semester after for an online course, and then she's looking for a 75% successful completion rate. Because just getting them signed up for that is, is only half the battle. Um, obviously, they had poor habits that got them in, into those problems. So we've been able to save money, expand the program, um, quality of the program, and follow through on it and be successful with it. OK. Interesting. Huh. That, that's very intriguing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, we'll move on to Kim. Uh, discuss your knowledge and any specific experiences in helping a district measure and report its own progress towards a strategic vision. We do that. Um, most of you remember our annual reports were much more detailed than they are today. We kind of um, meet the minimum standard today and we stick it on the website. Um, we, we still work real hard off the annual report, but I also think um, whole district improvement plan and mm -hmm. school improvement plan, if you're familiar with those, drive most of that today. So the state requires us to repeat each year, look at data, repeat our goals, say how we're measuring ourselves, did we reach our measurement. And we report that out to our community and our reporter as well. Um, it, you know, like you, very transparent on your website on graduation rates, um, test data, um, I think that's a big piece to make sure everyone sees that and knows that as well and how you're progressing. We, we evaluate ourselves on that from a board. We do a yearly board evaluation as well as that's part of my evaluation as well as the building evaluation. We call it linking, so the whole teacher, new teacher um, evaluation system, which is not well defined from the state and none of us can quite figure out how to measure successful teaching yet. Um, but we do link at that, and so the number of teachers who are successful in reaching their goals is part of the principal's evaluation, and that teachers provide a data file to the administrator. The administrator does the same for me, and my evaluation also based all the way back to the teachers and how many are successful <coughs> and have the students reach their goal. Do you do reports for the Board of Education, class size, and building capacity, enrollment? Yes, and I think we do that probably a little bit different than you. Um, we often do that through presentations. And so the board, um, will s for the year, we will talk about the number of presentations, what they would like to see. And so we open our meeting usually recognizing students and teachers who have done something, and then followed by a presentation from building administrators or teachers. And it is generally data based on a program or student achievement data. We report out our MEEP scores, not just the score to our, our board, but exactly what areas our students performed well, areas of need, goal areas for the next year. But we do that through presentations to the board. Great. If I called your board president about that, how would he how would he characterize that and how would he characterize the performance? 
he, he would absolutely love, he loves our presentation. I think our whole board does. And our administrators do a very good job on that piece of it. And our student achievement is um, very good. It always has been. Um, when the whole new cut score came about, there was some fear of that whole, hey, we went from 98 in reading in third grade, and now we're a 63. You know, and so, I mean, I don't know about your district, but most of the state also struggles with the elementary science test still. And so that's an area of concern for us as well. I actually think it gets forgotten. But maybe not so much with Dow here. Maybe you guys do a little better job than we do in the science area. But I think with elementary teachers by trade, you know, it's ELA, reading, writing, math, and science gets pushed to the side. So we're working really hard on the science component as well as our test. But our test scores are very good. Angela. Tell us about one initiative you are most proud of that you have implemented in your district. What was the largest potential barrier to implementation, and how did you overcome that issue? IB is jumping out of my head, but we've talked about it so much <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe I should pick something else here. Um, initiative from the district. Let's, let's talk about another one that we're looking at besides the one-to-one -one and IB. We have been looking at, for about a year now, um, year-round schedule. And so um, we would like to, to encourage enough parents that we would have at least one of our elementaries go to a year-round schedule. Not necessarily more days, but the whole loss of learning through the summer, no more than two to three weeks off at, during any, any intercession. Um, we're close to being able to do that. I think probably not um, the fall of 13, but the fall of 14, we will have that um, enough parents to partake in that. Um, as you know, many times parents don't just see it as, a, as education, they also see the whole babysitting latchkey piece of it. And so the intercessions are vital for us to build um, quality intercessions cheap enough so when those parents, the non-traditional time period when students are off, um, particularly if they have two students in their system and one is in the high school where we're not. How does that work? Yeah, they're, <laughs> they're going to need these intercessions. And so we began to work real hard with that piece of it. So it's one where we're not there yet, but <coughs> an initiative that I've created, we, we've started, my elementary principals are bought into, we're sh we've shared data with our community, and we show the whole piece of learning loss. Uh, meanwhile, to address it, we've really gotten creative about what we now call summer academy instead of summer school for the negative, um, to, to move away from the negative piece of it. Um, and we do that at the end of summer. So, you know, you get out mid-June, and, we, and we're off for three or four weeks. We go through the July holiday, and then we bring, we bring our students back in, particularly those of a need. Um, the data is clear. At-risk students have large pieces of learning loss. Um, so parents, of, if we like it or not, the number one indicator still in America of student achievement is, is wealth, socioeconomic status. we got to fix that. It can't be. Um, so those who have, provide quality learning experiences for their children during the summer. Those who don't aren't, are not able to, and the learning loss is large. And so I know you're struggling with increasing diversity. Um, those are some pieces that we've done that could help as well. Excellent. Any follow-ups? Uh, I think we're on to Scott, if I'm not mistaken. I think so. Can you tell us why you think you'd be a good fit as a superintendent in Midland Public Schools? And the second part to that question is, if you know, what do you think are the most significant issues facing Midland Public Schools, and how would you begin to address them? It was ironic. Um, I'm not looking necessarily for a job, and then your, your position came open. I had kind of looked at it and said, well, having been in Mount Pleasant, having grew up in Michigan, drive through it every, every few weeks on my way to my cottage, I know quite a bit about the community. Dow, I have some friends who live here, really interesting job, and then um, I got a call from Dave, and um, I said, Dave, it's ironic, you're calling, I'm looking at it, and I would very much, my, my town, Elginac, is my hometown, my family's been there for hundreds of years, it's a difficult idea to think about leaving, but I, I look at the potential, I look at your community, I look at your very good school district, I, I have 10 to 12 years left in my career, what a great way to finish moving Midland potentially from good to great. Um, and so uh, it's a great opportunity to come look at look at, at Midland. Some of your issues, I think, are a whole lot like Algonac, and I, so I think I could be a good fit. Um, we've done a lot of parallel, similar things, even though at a different size, you know, from IB to early childhood, 
you're looking at mobile technology. Um, we've done a lot of those in Algonac, and so it, it fits with my philosophy, what I believe. Um, obviously, there would be a big change. Midland's not Algonac, and um, some of the pieces that you would expect out of your superintendent is something I've got to ask myself, am I willing to do because that's something different than what I do in Algonac. Although, I, I do sit on many foundations and community organizations, which you would probably expect <coughs> to be done here. It's just not the same as your community. And so, um, over the last three or four weeks, I've had many of those discussions with my spouse and, and asked myself, is that what I want to do over the next 10, 12 years? Or am I, am I pretty comfortable on Algonac? And so, I'm here today, so I must convince myself that it's the right fit. Follow-ups. I have one since you've had a move from Texas and it was kind of going back home so maybe it's not a fair comparison yep. you you had to adapt back to Algonac uh, what were the biggest things that you struggled with uh, or you found the most difficult as you came back into your hometown right um, to be honest um, I, gu I guess I always knew this and and the previous superintendent was there 16 years and he vastly changed Algonac I, I've I finished a product and I've grown it further, but he changed it. Uh, Algonac was not a district that um, would have been a district of choice in our county um, when I was a student. Um, it was a district that struggled. Um, property tax was not a good proposal. It was a wonderful thing for Algonac. Uh, they failed millages. The property tax was sky high, growing fast on the water. No one passed millages. No one wanted more property taxes. The school was not important. You know what that did prior to proposal A to school districts in Michigan. And so um, for me, when I came right back to Algonac, I think the biggest thing from the Woodlands, Texas, to Algonac was the concept of being just okay and moving to greatness. And the, our previous superintendent, who was my mentor, never took no for an answer. And he was an idea guy, and he was creative. Now, we were the guys who carried it out for him often. But you know, he, he was the one who first put the thought of IB High School in my head as a high school principal. And at first I said to him, well, I don't think we can do that in Algonac. But, you know, we had to move forward. And so I think the biggest change for me from Texas coming back to Algonac was not being just okay, but looking and wanting to do better. And so as our scores went up, for example, at the high school, we didn't want to lead St. Clair County. We wanted to lead Macomb and Oakland County. And one year we only finished behind Birmingham. Now, put Algonac in the definition of Birmingham, most people would not do that. And so um, I, I think that was the biggest change for me coming back home. The other part was, um, prejudices. So obviously I knew last names and that was a good and a bad thing. I knew a lot about everybody which allowed me to have insight but also I had to block out any preconceived ideas I had by name because that wasn't fair to students who were coming through my system. So that was that was different as well. When I arrived as, back to Algonac High School I also had teachers who had me and so when I'd walk in to evaluate <laughs> I would just struggle with that. <laughs> <laughs> what would then, um, just translating that, and as you're looking forward to coming here, what would you see as My, some of the challenges fear, you're concerned about? Yeah, personal challenges for me, you know, the fear of um, the unknown. And, and I've worked in, if you looked at my resume, four different school districts, two different states. So you, you would say, well, he's not afraid of moving. But then you go back and say, I've been in Algonac 16 or 17 years. You have to look that up. 16 or 17 years now. And there's, you know, that comfort level of being somewhere for a long time. So this is the most, the biggest move for me in quite a while. I probably only have one left, one move left in me. Um, my children are now grown and like so many of our children, out of state. And so uh, my wife and I struggle. We're just at that age and say, hey, you know, retirement's 12, 13 years down the road. We need to save a little more. We need, where do we want to finish? What is retirement? Where is it going to be? And so... Um, it, as I began to look at this, you know, I, um, our city manager in a while, for a while in Algonac was your city manager. Um, I began to talk to people, Carl Tommy and other people who know Midland, what a wonderful place to live, get some of the assets you have here. And um, I think my wife's more excited than I am in, in some ways. So it, we've heard wonderful things here. Um, I just think it's going to be, it would be a great place to be. Okay. Our time is up for the interview portion and now we will turn the tables for you Matthew to you asking us questions so and we'll try to have different people address your questions today I actually spent two hours and saying what questions do I want to ask you guys and I don't really have a lot it's, it's amazing 
your web page is very informative. Um, I feel like I know some of you after watching months of videotape of you <laughs> in the board meeting. And so um, the, obviously I don't, but uh, I, I feel like there's a lot of information about you and there's a lot of information about me um, in today's world out there. Um, I say that part first. I was going to close with this piece of it, but I'll say that first. And I hope that you have are finding as much information you like about me as I do about you, because I very much like what I've seen about the Midland School District. Um, there's concerns and questions. I don't know if it's a question or it's comments. You know, obviously my wife's an educator, and so moving Algonac to Midland is not drivable, and I'm sure you prefer someone to move in. And so how do I transition during that time period of finding a job for my spouse in a difficult time to find a job in, the, in these economic times? We all know what housing's like and selling a house and finding a home here. Those are all major concerns and questions for me as well um, that can be explored down the road and, and figured out. I don't think those are questions for you right now. So I've thought about those type of I issues. Um, I'm coming from 23% fund equity to 16, and I think you're at 12. You know, I, I, I look at that, and, and I'm sure you guys have begun to say, okay, is that enough to get us through these troubling times? And um, part of our plan at Algonac has always been to make sure that fund equity carries it long enough that we're the last 30% of the school districts that get in line and say we're broke, because by then they'd have to fix it if 70% of them are, are in line in front of us. And, you know, we know what happened in Saginaw just a couple of days ago, so it's starting to happen. But um, so 12% fund equity, is that is that enough to work with? But then I look at what you guys are doing, which is you're, you're seeking alternative revenue um, in order to carry your programs today, and hopefully you're successful. Um, so, you know, that's very exciting. I've been through that once in my career, so I came in and passed the bond and, and was able to do all those wonderful things you can do for children with bond money. So that's kind of exciting if you are able to um, put money towards technology and fix your buildings back up with your sinking fund. Um, in some ways, we're a step ahead in the sense that we've had that bond, and, and my district buildings are sound like they're probably more 21st century ready than you are at this point. Um, that's not a good or a bad. Um, I think you've got a great plan, you know, set out to look at those type of things. So I don't really have many questions. I've asked Dave. Um, Dave's here tonight. Okay. Not here tonight. Not here tonight. Okay. I didn't realize that. I've asked Dave lots of questions about you, and, and I've asked people a lot of questions. So I don't really have any at this point. I think if we move further down the line, I will have more for you. Uh, many of the questions I thought today are not appropriate to ask at this time. Okay. Um, so if you have no more questions, we're done a little early. I'll give you a chance to kind of give a closing comment or statement, something you want us to know about you that we haven't touched. Sure. Um, I, I guess I would close again, you know, if you, if you had an opportunity to look at the Algonac School District, um, we, we are considered to be probably the most creative, progressive little district in, in our area. And, um, and again, some of that goes to my predecessor who mentored me and brought me along um, in order to do that. And so creativity is the key to where we're going. Um, in the future here. You know, education is going to change so fastly um, that you need someone to think outside the box, someone who's a risk taker. Does, doesn't mean they won't fail sometimes because they will. Make sure you understand that. Someone's going to fail, and, and that's not a bad thing always. You have to weigh your risk. You have to look at the data in order to do those things. Um, and I think Midland's primed, primed in that position to do that. Um, you have so many resources. You have a, sounds like a community that truly cares about education. I get a sense that you've gone through some change that's been difficult, but then I read it, when I read you guys going through it, I'm thinking, um, that's new for you, but it's old for some of us, and so um, maybe that's what the discomfort level, uh, the change and tough negotiations and some of the things it sounds like maybe you've gone through, um, been through that as well. And so um, six years into this, just now figuring this whole thing out and so it's your opportunity to get someone seasoned that's still got 10 or 12 years to go and and so I, I think I'm a, a very good candidate for you okay anything else from members of the board no. well seeing none thank you very much for coming up yeah. and be very if you're driving back tonight please be very careful if you're yep. driving back tonight <laughs> thank you you bet thank you I mentioned earlier, 
you will either hear Wednesday night or Thursday morning okay. for the farm deliberations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, as per last night, um, to stay legal, please refrain from talking to candidates outside of this open forum. Uh, do not, do not uh, come with preconceived notions. We have one more candidate to pick or to interview. Uh, tomorrow night, what we will go through is a process. Uh, we haven't talked much about that. I'd ask you to start thinking ahead a little time of what you see, not in comparison, but we have four now, what you think are the strong positives of a given candidate and maybe the strong deltas. Uh, not necessarily criticisms, but what they might be weak on that we would think we need. Uh, and then we'll have, we'll provide, I'll call it 15 minutes for self-reflection tomorrow night after the interview that you can each huddle down by yourself and say, how do I feel about the plus and minuses of, of that fifth candidate? Then we'll convene. Uh, we'll have a roundtable discussion about how we feel about those. Uh, while we have that, I'd ask a given board member to state how they felt uh, and each board member go around the table and then we will have a discussion about agreement or disagreement about those plus or minuses because a minus that someone else saw, someone may else have seen something else that offset that. At that point, uh, when that discussion kind of exhausts itself, uh, we will poll the board uh, with a piece of paper where you will write down your top choice through your bottom choice. Uh, giving a value of five to your top choice, a value of one to your bottom choice, and everything in between. I'll collect those and see if there's a common theme. And if there's a common theme, and often there is, uh, we'll learn if we have three that we all tend to think are the top, or the, the same three or not the same three, or two at the bottom, same three, or two at the two at the top that are clearly, and three that aren't. And we'll have a discussion then when we see those results. I'll announce those results when I compile them. And then we'll make a decision on, on where we provide the cut for the next round of interviews. Uh, we do need to get it to three as a maximum. And if it's clearly differentiated, taking it to two. Uh, it doesn't serve anybody to bring it three back in if it's clearly differentiated two versus, versus three. So that'll be the process tomorrow night that we go through. Dave will be here tomorrow night. And uh, hopefully at that point we'll be able to announce what what two we're bringing, two or three we're bringing in for the final interviews, which are two weeks from now. Uh, Cindy and I are actively working on what that second round will look like. Um, it will be, as Dave described to us, uh, they will be shown around the district, they will meet community leaders a little bit, and then they will come in for a second round of interview questions with us, and we'll begin formulating those after we know who the candidates are, because we'll be able to dig deeper into those candidates. And then, um, then there will be a dinner. I think we're going to be doing it at the H, correct, Cindy? That evening uh, after the interviews are over. And then, uh, then we get to deliberate again on who we think that last night. If there's three, it'll be the Thursday night. If it's only two, maybe the Wednesday night that we'll deliberate on who the, the finalist is. Any questions on that? So are we, when we talk about, are we talking about the candidates one at a time or are we talking about the criteria that we're using <coughs> one at a time, like here's, you know, IB and discuss. No, candidates one okay. at a time. Okay. Candidates one at a time. Thank you for the clarification on the question. So Easy. seven of us will each individually discuss one candidate at a time. Yes. Okay. So don't come in with 20 pros and 20 minuses, <laughs> you know, for each one. Distill it down that you think are the real key things. And they don't have to be uh, necessarily examples of a behavior. The behavior should just be able to reinforce the attribute you saw, okay? Or the accomplishment reinforce the attribute you saw, because we're looking for attributes uh, backed up by data that suggests that they really have those attributes. Um, so come ready to argue what the good ar attributes were and uh, ones you thought maybe were lacking. And then if someone challenged you, you'd be able to back that up with what you saw as evidence that that was true. So it'll be a long night. It's not going to be a short night. But it may fall out relatively quick, too. And you never know. All right. With that, uh, we'll stand adjourned. Has anybody got any emails from <laughs> downtown yet? <laughs>
Nope, I don't have one. So I'm assuming we don't have one. Okay, with How many? 21 out of 32. Okay, so we'll stay tuned for that. With that, uh, we'll stay adjourned, adjourned and see everybody tomorrow evening.